Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to have so many of you here today. It is my privilege as chair of the Equine Grass Sickness Fund to welcome you all here to what is, I think, maybe our third or fourth um, Equine Grass Sickness Conference, but the first for, for me. We had hoped that perhaps a very famous Anne, Her Royal Highness, might have been here, but instead you've got me, so please bear with me. Um, I hope that today we've got so many good speakers, um, so many interesting topics, um, and I, I hope that it will bring forward I ideas um, that you will bring forward to the um, panel session th this afternoon. Um, thanks to Beth and to Kate for organising this. It's been a mammoth task, and um, I hope you all enjoy your, your day. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Anne, for the lovely introduction. And um, if I can also add my welcome to you all. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Lee Innes. I'm the communications director here at the Morden, and we are all delighted to invite you to this uh, really special day. Um, as Anne said, we've, it's great to have uh, the top researchers in grass sickness here to tell you about the research and some of the advances that they've been made. Um, we're also delighted to have uh, some of the vets in practice who have really helped us with some of the biobank work, which you'll hear about later on, which is a fantastic resource uh, for research uh, and open to everyone. Um, and also the fundraisers. Um, if it wasn't for you, um, we couldn't do the research. So we're delighted to have you all together here at this conference um, so that we can all learn a bit about each other's worlds, each other's research, uh, and hopefully um, move forward to try and get an answer to this puzzle that has been uh, around for probably over about 100 years now. So I think if we cannot get the answer in this room, in the next five minutes, um, there'll be a problem. So we've got a day to get the answer. Um, but I've got a few um, housekeeping things for you all today. So um, I usually say at the fire safety drill that if the fire alarm goes off, um, please go to the fire exits at the back and the side. And I'm warning you today is Wednesday. And on Wednesday at Morden, there is always a fire alarm. <laughs> so um, at 11 o'clock, you will hear the alarm going off. Now, if I'm a bad chair of the session, Elspeth Milne will still be talking. Um, if I'm a good chair, Bruce McGoran will just have stood up to start talking. So when the alarm goes off, I apologise in advance to Elspeth and Bruce, um, just sit in your seats. If you see the Morden staff running for the exit um, <laughs> and there's smoke, please follow us to the exits. Otherwise, please sit in your seats and it will go off. So I'm sorry, it's just a Wednesday thing at Morden. Um, the conference is being recorded. We have some people. I'd like to also welcome the people who are joining in online. Um, so the conference is being recorded. Um, we're delighted that Melody will be taking some photographs at the event. If anyone has got a problem with that, please avoid Melody and do not look at this camera. Um, and I'd also like to thank very much the sponsors uh, for this event, um, Norbrook, Top Spec and Norvite. Uh, thank you very much for your generous support. We really appreciate it. Um, I'd also like to thank the Morden Foundation and the Equine Grass Sickness Fund for their support for this meeting. Um, and I'd particularly also like to thank Beth Wells and Kate Thompson uh, for their fantastic work to get us to today. Um, and also the Equine Grass Sickness Fund Committee um, and some of the Morden staff who've helped with this event. So we're delighted to welcome so many of you here today. Um, this is a follow on from we had a crucible event last year and the, that event where what we did was we brought together people who maybe didn't know anything about grass sickness. And I know that sounds slightly strange, but what we wanted to do is try and encourage some interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary thinking from all walks of life. So all disciplines were there. Some of the environmental people, um, we had some um, horse experts, we also had scientists from very different disciplines. And from that, we got some new ideas and hopefully some new directions for research. And I'm delighted today that some of the early career researchers who were at that Crucible event will be giving a couple of the presentations today, along with our experts, which is really exciting. Um, so I think without further ado, because we've got quite a packed programme today, um, 
what we're going to do, I will say to the speakers that we are going to be quite tough on you <laughs> time wise um, because it is, as you can see, it's quite a packed programme. Um, we will try if we've got time to do a short Q&A after the talks, but if we don't have time, um, please grab the speakers afterwards. We've got a few breaks, um, lunch break, and we've also got some panel discussions this afternoon. So please grab the speakers if you haven't had a chance to ask your question, and I'm sure they'd be absolutely delighted to um, help with that. Um, we've also got James Risk at the back, who's going to be doing some interviews with some of the speakers today. So um, he'll be doing some videos and he's in a special green room. So we'll, we'll direct you towards James for that. Um, so I think um, I think I said, oh, the other thing to say, sorry, I forgot to say this, because we have such a packed programme, if anyone has the need to rush out for a toilet break, please do. Um, if anyone wants to know where the toilets are, they're just out the back the fire doors and there's some along the corridor to the right or to the left. So please, if you need to go, please, please do that because um, it's quite a long session this morning. Um, right, so I think without further ado, I'm, it's my great pleasure to kick off the session um, by welcoming our keynote speakers. So our first speaker up today um, is Roly ours and Roly probably doesn't need an introduction to all of you but Roly um, qualified as a veterinary surgeon from Cambridge University and is chief executive of the charity World Horse Welfare and um, plays a very active role in the charity work liaising with government sport regulations universities and other organizations and he's on the board of BEVA and the UK Equine Disease Coalition so it's my great pleasure to um, have Roly as our first speaker today. Thank you. Marvellous. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Lee, thank you. Um, I, I feel a bit of a fraud when Lee introduces the, you know, the people who are here. There's the research experts, there's the vets. I am a vet, but I haven't been in clinical practice for many years and, and a fundraiser. I suppose I might be a fundraiser being involved with World Health Welfare, but I'm hugely grateful for the opportunity to come and, and speak today. Um, when Beth asked me to speak, um, I rather felt um, on the quote in green, the fact that I wouldn't have a clue what I was saying and, and nor would you, but I, I, in thinking about it further, I just wanted to, I'm here, I'm here as a horse owner, I'm here as an organisation, as you'll hear, that has an association with equine grass sickness. Um, and we're only going to beat this ghastly disease if we work together. And my, my mantra today and my simple message today is that we are all in this together and we are better together. A very sort of uh, overused phrase, but it is very, very true. So I just want to sort of give a little uh, overview of, of Welter's Welfare as association with grass sickness, then to give some examples well away from what we're talking about today before bringing it back together with that very, very simple message. So um, if we look at grass sickness and world horse welfare, unfortunately, we do have the horrible saying, we do have skin in the game. We have four rescue and rehoming centres around the country. Um, and whilst two of them haven't had any cases in the last decade, two of them have. And as you'll see, our farm in a Boyne in Aberdeenshire um, has all too much of an association with, with this ghastly disease, having uh, 22 cases over the last 10 years most of which have been fatal. And if there's one thing that I would love never to see again or feel again is that sick feeling when you walk into a field and you see a horse and you think, oh my God, and you know what's ahead and what's likely to happen. And if we can avoid that ever happening again, we're, we're, boy, will we have done a, a good thing. So we have done over the years to try and do our bit as well towards welfare to, to support the extraordinary efforts that have gone over the years to beast, uh, beat this disease. Um, we collaborated in the vaccine trial. And we and we have provided samples for the biobank, especially from our farm in Bell Wade, from from blood to feces to post mortem um, samples, but also environmental uh, samples and data. And I think that's something that all of us 
can get involved with both directly and by providing the the message around what the opportunity is for the biobank and how that you know over the years uh, months and years ahead really is an opportunity for, for us to get on top of equine grass sickness so i that's a sort of the association that wells horse welfare has with equine grass sickness now i'm just going to give you a few examples of where the equine sector really has worked quite well together. We often think of ourselves as a very disparate sector, and we are. Um, but we equally, um, I think over the last decade especially, and it's happening more and more, we, there's more and more examples of where working together really can work. Um, Back in, um, before the pandemic, the British Horse Council uh, was established and that was a, um, a merger of the Equine Sector Council for Equine Health and Welfare and the British Horse Industry Confederation. And it, it, it's established as a company, I think in 2018, and it provides a mean for UK's equine stakeholders to speak to government. Now, in the main, um, this is often with the, the UK government in Westminster, but it's certainly not the sole government that we speak to. Um, and indeed, it's a real pleasure often to be able to speak to the Scottish government because you can get such closer association uh, with the Scottish government than you can with the other devolved administrations or in Westminster, which is a, which is a great opportunity and a great accolade to, to the Scottish government of all colours. Um, and, and what we've done over the years is to engage with governments around issues around the uh, Brexit, around um, COVID-19 um, and many other issues, some of which I'll, I'll talk about. But the key thing about the British Horse Council is it brings together and the directors currently come from the British Equine Veterinary Association, the British Horse Council, uh, the, the British Horse Society, uh, British Equine Trade Association, World Horse Welfare, British Equestrian Racing, um, both through uh, the British Horse Racing Authority and the Thoroughbred. Bread Breeders Association so, uh, and also the Horse Trust. So it really is a combination of, uh, of organisations that are trying to work together. The aim of the, the council is very much to try and bring the voice together wherever possible. Now with a, a sort of an array of a sector of that wide, we aren't going to agree on everything, but there's plenty that we do agree on and where we do, we can actually uh, magnify that voice and where we have different opinions, we can put those to forward in a constructive uh, dialogue to government because there's nothing easier for a government. Uh, you've got a sector that is at war with each other. You're not going to get any change and it's a great excuse for the government to do nothing. So even where disagreements are, there is an opportunity to be, actually create those disagreements and those different opinions in a constructive manner that is going to engage change in the longer term. So I think it is a, a wonderful example. It's certainly not perfect. Uh, of where actually the sector can work well together. It has regular meetings with um um, the uh, with DEFRA, but it also has regular meetings with the chief veterinary officers of all four countries: England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Oh, I seem to have gone far too quickly. Um, so, um, next example is Equine ID. Now, I could sp spend the next 15 hours talking about Equine ID if you wanted me to, which I know you don't. Um, but ever since the horse meat scandal of, of, of a decade ago now, um, it has been obvious that um, the equine identification system in this country simply does not work. And through the British Horse Council, um, we, we have pushed very hard for the estab establishment of the central equine database and of course in Scotland we have Scott uh, Scott Equine as well and you know that engagement has involved a huge number of different organizations but we know when it comes to equine id the database is only good as the data in it and that's why we have to in a 21st century world have a digital solution and that is something that we're actively engaged with defra and actually the indications are that defra will move towards a digital only equine id system but of course that's only going to work because defra in this regard only speaks for england it's only going to work if Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland come to. Um, to be, DEFRA, to be fair, have been very engaged in this, pro, uh, in this process and I know Scottish Government had an involvement in the DEFRA consultation last year um, and we will continue to be engaged um, and it's actually been a, a great opportunity in Scotland with the, the likes of Horse Scotland, the, the BHS, SSPCA and Scottish Racing along with World Horse Welfare. The photo top left is meeting Mary, the, the, well she 
she is, I'm not sure she is still current uh, cabinet secretary, uh, um, given the cu current changes, but she certainly was until yesterday, cabinet secretary, Mary Grosjean, um, and she has been actively engaged in discussions around equine ID. And I very much hope that uh, whoever uh, takes it well, and if it's Mary, then it'll certainly, that dialogue will certainly carry on. Another example of collaboration is the National Equine Welfare Council. This was actually established back in 1977 and now obviously involves the, all, a, a lot of the um, equine um, charities, equine rescue centres, large and small, um, but also now has a growing array of other members, including the disciplines and racing, uh, Olympic disciplines and racing and um, an increasing number of academic institutions. So it's got over 65 members and its mission is very simple, to raise awareness of equine welfare issues and help improve equine welfare standards nationwide. And one of the great assets that Newt brings is in a world where actually anyone can set up an equine rescue centre, it actually brings in basic standards. And so to join the National Equine Welfare Council, those uh, institutions have to have a visit and have to actually sign up to a, a set of standards standards, the voluntary standards through the National Equine Welfare Council. But what has come increasingly valuable is its, um, its role in large scale welfare cases. Um, I've been at the charity for 15 years and in my, in my first week was the, um, the horrific um, um, uh, welfare case involving over 150 animals um, down north of London, Spindles Farm. That was just extraordinary because of its size then. Now it's not extraordinary. I, 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 um, welfare cases taking over 100 animals is not unusual. And there is not, even the RSPCA and the SSPCA, they do not have the facilities to take in these kind of numbers. So actually, when we have these large welfare cases, the National Nuke has been brilliant in actually divvying up different organisations taking on a certain number of the animals. But we can also look internationally and see that actually when you're thinking about Europe, when you're thinking globally, it could equally deliver results. We, there's an organisation called the European Horse Network, and that represents members rather like the British Horse Council from across the sector involving breeding, sport, racing, science, education, welfare, tourism and business. And it's to help inform EU policy. World Source Welfare is also a member of Eurogroup, which represents animal welfare organisations across Europe for exactly the same purpose. And back in 2015, Eurogroup, World Source Welfare, and with the support of the uh, European Horse Network, we produced the first ever um, report on the equine sector to set out the scope scale and real, identify the real welfare challenges of the EU's equine sector. And that's had a profound impact, um, ultimately uh, leading through the EU animal welfare platform to um, guidance on responsible ownership, responsible, responsible tourism, and also efforts currently to, to um, um, update legislation, including the slaughter legislation, transport legislation and kept animals bill. And even at a global level, uh, a number of organisations, including the Donkey Sanctuary and World Tools Welfare, are members of the World Federation for Animals. And that was set up to try and actually have a focus at those global institutions, including the United Nations. And, um, and it's one that's had already a significant result because last March at the United, Environment, United Nations Environmental Assembly, there was a first ever resolution on animal welfare. But it can also have a real impact on animal health and welfare. For instance, and I for, uh, forgive me, if you ever want to go into acronym bingo, international development is your space because the number of acronyms in the world of international development is quite extraordinary. Some of you have, have heard of the World Organization for Animal Health, often known as WOA. It used to be known as the OIE, of course it was. Um, but it, it has um, a memorandum of understanding with the International Coalition for Animal Welfare, ICFOR. And part of ICFOR is ICWI, which is the International Coalition for Working Equids. I hope you're concentrating because there is a test on this later. And the ICWI, the International Coalition for Working Equids, is made up of the Brook, the Donkey Sanctuary, Sparna and World Horse Welfare. And it, it, was, it was established in 2017 and it were actually in, helped to uh, go, provide guidance to member countries on uh, the World Organization for Animals Health's Working Equid chapter. And it's also provided direct support to WOA through underground training in Africa, Asia and in Central America. Um, it, it was... It, 
there's a number of disease outbreaks uh, across the world and in uh, in West Africa, Cambodia and Nepal. And ICWI has had, because of the, the opportunities to work through the local networks that the charities have, it was able to get two uh, equine owners on the ground and provide them with basic guidance how to, pr to protect their horses from some from glanders, African horse sickness and equine influenza. And ICWI has also expanded its role now to international advocacy um, around the uh, horrific trade in donkey skins that some of you all know, but also on the role of working equid in achieving United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, and last week, ICWI hosted a side event at the United Nations World Water Week to, to, to great effect, where we looked at exploring the relationship between women, uh, water, and working animals, and there is a significant and close relation there. So when we work with a common purpose, we really can have a real impact. Briefly, to look at equine disease, um, many of you will know that equine disease surveillance and protection has been very much funded and led by racing. But back in 2019, thanks to the likes of Jane Nixon, um, the British Equestrian set up the Equine Disease Infectious Disease Advisory Group, and it has luminaries like Scott Peary and R Richard Newton on it, chaired am amazingly by Professor Celia Ma. And it's done a great job in helping the sector manage the equine herpes outbreaks in Europe in 2021 and this year. And it was also really helpful in uh, guidance around the uh, vaccine, uh, equine influenza vaccine shortage last, last year. Um, but with the demise of the Animal Health Trust back in 2020, which is obviously a huge loss to the industry, there has been a real need to identify a future proof equine disease surveillance system. A couple with this and the fact that, again, it's DEFRA, but very, they are talking to devolved administrations around the establishment of these animal health and welfare pathways. There is a great opportunity to actually put something together that is not only funded by racing, but uh, funded a across the sector and that will be something uh, where people will have to put money where their mouth is um, and actually it's slightly frustrating that it hasn't gone quicker because now we're three years on after the Animal Health Trust demise but I think there is a real opportunity this year that we will finally have a disease surveillance system that will work for us in the years ahead. Two final examples, Weltall's Welfare is funding a, um, a project at Royal Veterinary College looking at, ethical, looking at social licence and the ethics of involving horses in sport and this has pro produced um a framework and a tool for um, the sector to be able to use when making decisions around involving horses in sport and i think that the ad ad adoption of that framework and that tool was only possible because of engagement in polo, in racing, and across all the other equestrian disciplines. And I think actually having these kind of tools available in the world that we live in, where we do need transparency uh, and justification for what we're doing with our animals, it becomes ever more important. And of course, perhaps um, most graphically over the last year is um, last March, um, or end of um, end of February last year, when Russia invaded Ukraine. Initially, there was a huge uh, need or desire to get horses out of the country. Then there was obviously a huge need to get aid into the country. And uh, there was a wonderful opportunity where organisations came together, um, BETA, BEVA, uh, BHS, World Horse Welfare and British Equestrian. And over the last year, we have provided over £450,000 of aid, both feedstuffs and veterinary supplies, and the, the fund itself has raised over £300,000. So it's a graphic example of where, when there is this horrific acute need, the sector really can come together um, and make a difference. So in a nutshell, we work better when we're together. There's been a huge amount done um, to, to, to understand and develop our understanding of equine grass sickness over the last 100 years, but we are still some way from a, a solution. But if we work collaboratively and we work on the existing frameworks that we have and we double down our efforts, I really do believe uh, there is an opportunity for us to finally uh, crack this particularly hard nut. The biobank and the current work is a massive step in the direction. And so I ask you, as a, as, as a horse owner, as an organisation that's involved in equine grass sickness over many years, and as someone who, like you, will share that we, we want to finally see the back of this disease, we really are better together. Thank you very much indeed.
thank you very much, Rolly, and, and for sticking for time and also giving such a fantastic talk over, give, overview of all the very complicated organisations uh, that are involved. That was that was really interesting. Um, I'm going to let, is, is there anyone got a quick question for Rolly? I know we're a bit short of time. Any burning questions? Um, no, OK, thank you for that. And thank you very much for the presentation. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce our next keynote speaker, um, Professor Chris Proudman. Um, and Chris is the head of the School of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Surrey. Um, he's a recognised specialist in equine gastroenterology and has over 25 years experience in equine uh, research in this area. His current projects are looking at omics technologies to better understand the equine intestinal microbiome in health and disease. Um, my great pleasure to introduce Chris to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so it's a very great pleasure to be here today. Um, I was um, absolutely delighted to receive the invitation uh, from Beth to come and speak at this meeting. At least I was until she told me what she wanted me to talk about. Now, I'm quite used to talking about science and research that I'm doing, but Beth said, actually, what we want you to talk about is uh, working in partnership and how we can how we can all work together to uh, to make progress against equine grass sickness. So that was a challenge, but actually it's a challenge that I've quite enjoyed. Um, and uh, I've been able to uh, look at the breadth of research and really ha have a look at the way some other partnerships have worked together um, and try to distill from that some mess messages, some lessons to, to bring to this meeting. Um, so this is a little bit of a flight of fancy. Bear with me um, as I go through this presentation. Um, what I'm going to do um, is to look at some um, collaborative clinical science research from 100 years ago. <clears throat> have a look at some uh, have a look at grass sickness research uh, today. And um, I've got an example from um, scientific research elsewhere from another field, which I think is very relevant to this. So um, my first example is, is history. Um, and as some of you in the room know, the first part of my career, I spent a lot of time doing surgery, a lot of intestinal surgery and seeing, ending up seeing, unfortunately, quite a lot of um, horses that ultimately had grass sickness. Um, but one of my surgical heroes, um, is this person on the left, Sir Harold Gillies, um, who had a, a, an amazing surgical career and uh, is now widely regarded as one of the pioneers of plastic and reconstructive surgery. So his surgical career um, really took off um, at the start of the First World War um, when he was tasked with developing a team to deal very specifically with soldiers coming back from the front um, with really disfiguring and um, very dysfunctional injuries as a result of um, uh, injuries from um, uh, from rifles, from shrapnel, particularly injuries to the face and to the jaw and to the teeth. Um, you can see from the pictures here, this, this is one of the less graphic um, uh, wounds that he had to deal with. Um, some of the injuries were, were just horrendous. Um, at the time, there were very little, um, there was very little in the surgical literature. Very few surgeons had experience of dealing with these things. And he also recognised very soon that one, one, one of the problems that he was dealing with was actually that this wasn't just about surgery. Um, it was about dentistry, it was about nursing, it was about nutrition. So he needed to put together a team of people um, to deal with these problems. He was also very keen that the lessons that he learnt during this really intensive period of dealing with um, wounded soldiers with very special um, injuries and particular needs, that the lessons learnt should be captured for future generations and to advance the field of uh, what later became known as plastic surgery. So he developed a hospital at Sidcup in Kent and this is this is a list of the various disciplines that he recruited to work in his hospital. Now, some of them are sort of obvious, the surgeons, the nurses. Um, very soon, very quickly, he recognised that dentistry was a really important part of, uh, of what he needed to 
provide for um, in, in order to to repair these soldiers injuries. Um, but he also recognised he wanted to capture images um, so that he could track the progress of his cases. Um, photography worked to a certain extent. He used a lot of photography. Um, if any of you are interested in this, if you if you Google his name, um, there's all sorts of interesting photographic evidence of the cases that came up. Actually, a lot of this came th came from a book that I've recently read, um, uh, a book by Lindsay Fitzharris, uh, a medical historian who has uh, written a fascinating uh, monograph about Harold Gillies and particularly his work in the First World War. But um, Henry Tonks, um, this guy was an artist. He wasn't just any old artist. Uh, so Henry Tonks drew and painted these two pictures here of, uh, of one of Gillies patients. Tonks was actually a professor of surgery at the Slade School of Art in London. Um, he wasn't eligible for war service, but he was very keen to sign up and help. And uh, his artistic skills could be used to great effect in this surgical unit. The surgeons could only do so much at the time. One of the strategies for helping these, uh, these soldiers to, um, uh, to, to recover from their injuries and have a facial appearance that was acceptable in public one of the strategies was actually to develop masks um, to cover particularly injured areas. And um, the, the two people that I've illustrated here on the right are Francis Derwent Wood and Anna Coleman Ladd, both very eminent sculptors of their time. Um, these people exhibited at the Royal Academy on a regular basis. They received commissions. Um, they were at the, the, the top of their game um, and they were drafted in to help develop the, the masks that, um, um, that were used um, in many of these cases. Um, at the bottom here, administrators. One of the, <clears throat> one of the ways that Gillies realised that he had to work was slowly. Um, he recognised very early on that trying to do things all at once, trying to um, create a fix in these soldiers um, was a long term game. These soldiers often um, had multiple procedures over a course of two years or sometimes more. And um, in between treatments, in between surgeries, the soldiers were often discharged from the hospital. They needed to come back again. So he needed people to keep track of these soldiers to to make appointments for them to come back for checkups and for um, further surgical procedures later on. So um, the administrators were absolutely key to the success of, um, uh, of what Gillies was doing. Um, one of the mantras of his team apparently was to never do today what you can put off till tomorrow. Quite the opposite of what we, uh, what we often, uh, uh, the, the, the mantra we, we often use in day-to-day -day life. But he was a great believer in letting things heal and then moving on to the next stage of the procedure. <clears throat> so around about the same time, a um, few years afterwards, um, uh, Mr. Tocker, I don't think he was a doctor, um, uh, was conducting the studies that many people in this room know about, the, um, the very early vaccination trial that was conducted of equine grass sickness. Now, um, I am no expert on this subject at all. There are others in the room who know far more about this than me, but I have been back to one of the descriptions of, uh, of the work that, that Tocker did, just to look at the um, extent of the collaboration that was involved um, in, in his vaccination trial. And we can see here, um, he does acknowledge um, some of his collaborators. Um, what I was also really interested to see, and I was totally unaware of this, um, but he had assistance from someone called Henry Welcome, um, one of the one of the most eminent um, industrial um, bioscientists of his era, and the originator of the Welcome Trust, which just happens to be one of the wealthiest biomedical research charities in this country at this point in time. Now, I don't know whether the Grass Sickness Fund has ever used this, but I think this could be a great lever for getting um, uh, getting the Welcome Trust to work in collaboration um, with the fund uh, to, to sponsor equine grass sickness research. And um, they might have been down that route already, I don't know, but I thought this was this was really quite interesting. <clears throat> okay, um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about um, a science project that I've been involved with in recent years, um, not, not in a subject area that is my particular specialism, um, but I'll explain my involvement in a minute. But a number of colleagues of mine at the University of Surrey um, for many years were involved in a, a collaborative group of European scientists who were particularly interested in foodborne zoonoses, antimicrobial resistance, 
and emerging disease threats. Um, and they, this, um, this consortium very successfully applied um, to the Horizon Europe Fund and they um, were successfully funded. Um, their project was called the One Health European Joint Programme, the EJP European Joint Programme. <clears throat> I want to tell you a little bit about this because it's a fantastic example, I think, of um, research collaboration, but it goes beyond that as well, as you will see. So this is massive across Europe. 44 partner organisations are involved from 22 different European countries. So the setup is that each country nominates um, an animal health organisation, research institute, and also um, a public health, a human public health institute. And those two organisations work together because this is about zoonotic disease, disease that comes from animals to humans. Um, so really important that both of those elements are represented here. Um, and uh, you can see the array of European countries and some from in outside the European Union as the UK as the UK now is um, that are involved in this project. Um, this project is funded to the tune of almost 100 million euros and that 100 million euros is matched by funding from all of the countries involved as well. So the, the governments and um, human health organisations, medical agencies within the, uh, the countries involved in the project, they are stakeholders in this and they contribute financially um, to the activities of this, uh, this partnership. So how do you, how do you operate a, a collaboration like this, a research collaboration? Well, I'll tell you first about the, the governance structure that's been put in place. And this is important because as you can imagine with um, a research pot of a hundred million pounds, it's really important that all of the stakeholders, all of the organisations involved feel that they have a say in the way that that money is spent, that there is openness and accountability and that everybody feels that um, they have an equal call on this pot of money um, for research funding and for other activities as well. So there are these various committees that, um, that form the, the governance structure. Um, we, have to, um, we have to have a panel of ethics advisors as well. There are a number of animal studies that are involved in this work and we need to make sure that ethical standards um, are, are, are maintained throughout that work. Um, critically, there's a committee of stakeholders as well. So these are often very high level um, uh, ministerial governmental representatives um, who are both funding the project but they also have a vested interest in the outcomes from this project. They want to ensure that the learnings from this project are incorporated in healthcare policy um, for, for their country. The panel that um, I sit on is this scientific steering board. So each of the member organisations uh, nominates uh, a representative to sit on this panel and uh, we, we review applications for funding from this, this large pot of money which has been made available. Um, uh, we then vote on um, which projects we want to see funded, which is a balance of the quality of the science that's, uh, that's being proposed and the potential outcomes, the impact of the research that's happening as well. But everybody, everybody has uh, a say in this. Um, you can see there's also an external advisory committee as well. This is very much a panel of experts um, who, uh, who comment on the project, who comment on the, the outcomes that come from this, this non-specialist um, steering board. Um, so you can see there's, there's quite a complicated um, governance structure to make sure that this all works. Um, when I went into it to start with, I thought, not sure about this, um, not very comfortable with this. It seems like a lot of effort um, that's really not leading anywhere. But over the course of the years, I've recognised how important that is to make sure that, that everybody is represented and that the consortium operates um, in an open and transparent manner. So moving on to the science now, what, what, what um, well, it's not just science actually, but the work of this project, what are they actually trying to achieve? Um, so what we're doing is working in a number of different areas and you can see these different work packages um, that are on here. Um, so scientific projects, I think um, a lot of people in the room will understand what they look like, but also interestingly, some integrative projects. Now, these are about taking the science and applying them 
adapting policies across Europe to make sure that everybody's aligned. So, for example, there are a number of microbiological reference laboratories here. Those laboratories were all working to, to different protocols and different standards. So the sort of thing that the integrated projects do is to um, make sure that standards are harmonised across Europe. That then allows people to share data. It, it allows us to compare apples with apples rather than apples and oranges. Another important work package, education and training. So um, as you see, there are a number of PhD studentships that are involved in this project. This is about the sustainability of um, uh, zoonotic, oops, the sustainability of um, foodborne zoonosis research across the European Union. We need to make sure that there's a new generation of researchers coming through um, who are benefiting from the experience that's already in the consortium and who have a, a vested interest and a career aspiration to, uh, to continue this research. <clears throat> um, so I, I think this is a nice summary of the three major areas of work, uh, three major scientific areas um, that I've spoken about already. Um, the research projects, which usually involve um, three or more of the partner organisations. Um, some of the some of the research projects involve more than that, up to eight or ten. The integrated projects where um, the, the consortium makes sure that uh, information and knowledge is disseminated and is incorporated into, uh, into uh, policy uh, in their member countries and this education and training package as well. And so just drilling down a little bit further now, I know there's some, some scientists in the audience. So just to give some examples of the, uh, some of the specific research topics that have, um, um, have been the subject of, uh, uh, of research projects within this consortium. So next generation sequencing NGS based methods, again, some standardization of methods across laboratories in Europe. Um, been some work done in that area, so I keep clicking forward. Um, Lots there about about surveillance and um, uh, interventions um, necessary for um, uh, or, or for detection of outbreaks and the, the way that outbreaks are managed. So, how does this consortium of a huge number of scientists how does it interact with its um, with its stakeholders? Um, there are a number of ways that we do that now. The scientists in the room will will all recognise this one: peer-reviewed publications. That's important. Um, it's important that it's open access as well. Um, this means that there are no paywalls, that researchers anywhere in the world can access this information freely. And this is the way that the scientific community um, disseminates knowledge amongst itself. And that has never been easier. Um, with online databases that are now available, um, it's, it's really easy to put in very specific search terms um, and to come up with published papers um, that are relevant to the particular area that you want to work in. The consortium also runs scientific meetings. Um, uh, that's always a great opportunity to meet up with consortium members, uh, exchange ideas. As you can imagine, in recent years, some of those have had to be virtual, but nonetheless, they, um, they've been a successful means of scientific um, dissemination. The consortium is very aware, though, that um, this communication has to go on beyond the research community. In, in some ways, the research community is the easy part of the, um, the communications challenge. Um, so um, there is a whole work package around communication. There are a team of three people that are just dedicated to doing the, the communications piece around the work of this consortium. Um, they created these slides that I'm using, um, and I'm sure other consortium members have uh, have, have used these slides uh, in other meetings. They maintain a website where there are lots of links so that researchers or stakeholders, um, policymakers that are interested in a particular area of activities, they can very easily access the um, the outcomes and the learnings from the um, from the work of the consortium. Um, They've been fairly effective at getting this, this work out into the media as well. And every now and again, there are stories that come out um, that make it into um, the, the, uh, the public arena uh, or stories that are broadcast um, around uh, particular projects that the, the consortium has, has undertaken. So really important that um, the messages, the learnings don't just remain within the scientific community, but go much broader than that. OK, so I'm going to move on from the European One Health project now and um, 
just to say a few words about some of the other challenges that, that we face in science research and equine grass sickness research in particular, that I think are, are best faced um, as a partnership um, that we need to do in collaboration with other people. So just two slides about the science. Now, I'm very conscious that others later in this meeting are going to delve down into this area in a lot more detail. Um, but I'm very conscious that um, the omics technologies are an emerging set of disciplines, sciences. In some instances, they've, they've been around for a couple of decades now. There are other omics that are just developing. But we have a huge set of tools now that we can use to uh, investigate particular aspects of uh, of health and disease. But these are all really specialist areas. So we need technologists who understand the technology, who know how to apply it, and who can help us answer the questions that we want to ask about equine grass sickness. There are huge opportunities there, as we'll, we'll hear about later, um, but there is also a barrier to overcome in terms of um, understanding how to use those technologies effectively and to understand the limitations of those technologies. How far can we go? How far can we extrapolate from, um, uh, from omics projects to uh, the, the living organism to, to real life living animals? And for centuries now, we've had ologies, all sorts of ologies. Uh, so people that specialize in particular areas of, uh, of, of research, uh, uh, of science, and it's really important that, uh, that we make best use of that. We bring in people with a range of different specialities and disciplines um, to help us. So relevant to grass sickness, of course, um, pathologists have played a huge role in helping us to understand the disease. Um, I'm not sure we've involved immunologists as much as we might do, but they could potentially have a role, microbiologists. Um, but um, you know, what, about, what about sociologists? Um, what about psychologists in understanding how human behaviour might impact on the, uh, the incidence of grass sickness? So there are plenty of people from other disciplines that could potentially um, help us in, uh, in understanding the disease and understanding effective preventive strategies. Uh, I'm just going to run this animation now. Um, and some of you may have seen this. Um, I've, I've been showing it at meetings for a few years now. So. We've got a really complex situation with grass sickness where we understand some of the risk factors. We understand some of the things that are associated with the disease, but we don't quite understand how they all fit together. Um, and we certainly don't understand it enough to be able to intervene. So this animation, this is my best guess at the moment based on the evidence that we have of how these things may fit together. The causal pathway of equine grass sickness. What I've underlined are the risk factors that we have good scientific evidence for. Um, the things that I haven't underlined are maybe a little bit anecdotal, more anecdotal in nature. Um, but just thinking about how they might fit together, um, I think is an interesting exercise. Um, this may be wrong, um, and I do from time to time update this, but I'm really hoping for the day when I can update it, fix it and say, this is the definitive causal pathway. We know this is how it happens. But for the moment, this is, this is my take on what might be happening and how these various things might fit together um, to cause equine grass sickness. Um, at the centre of this at the moment, we think there are important things happening around um, bacteria, microbiota, and um, as you're going to hear later in the meeting, um, there's been a lot of interest in recent years around Clostridium botulinum um, and it's potentially its central role in the causation of equine grass sickness. Um, it might need lots of other things to, uh, to be in place to allow disease to happen, um, but th there, is, there is a reasonable body of evidence that others will review around botulinum. Um, so just in the last few minutes of my presentation, um, I just want to talk about the recent equine grass sickness vaccination trial that I know many people in this room were involved with in one way or another, um, which I think is actually a great example of collaborative science taking place. <clears throat> uh, before I embark on this, um, I just want to acknowledge uh, front and centre Joe Ireland, who's somewhere in the audience. Um, thank you, Joe, for, uh, well, for two things. Firstly, for 
uh, steering us all through this terrifically complex project. There are lots and lots of people involved, but every orchestra needs a conductor. And in this case, Joe was that person. And thank you also for letting me um, borrow your slides as well for this presentation. Um, so uh, for those of you who aren't uh, aware, this was um, a nationwide vaccination study, um, a randomised control trial um, that took place a few years ago um, to investigate the efficacy of a Clostridium botulinum vaccine against grass sickness. So the question we were asking is whether we could vaccinate horses and decrease the incidence of grass sickness, decrease the risk of them suffering from grass sickness by vaccination. The, the standard medical way of doing that is, the, the definitive proof is by use of this, this study design, um, having, a, having groups of horses, two groups of horses, one vaccinated, one not, and then having a look at the incidence of disease in those two groups. I'm not going to go into the study in, in great detail because it was hugely complicated. Um, but I want what I want to do is um, just to think about the level, the, the, the tremendous level of collaboration uh, and engagement of many different groups that made this study, um, uh, that allowed the study to, uh, to operate successfully. As many of us know, the outcome was not what we had hoped for. But nonetheless, this was a huge scientific achievement to, uh, to do this. So first of all, 88 participating veterinary practices. That is a huge number of, of veterinary practices who agreed to, to participate in the study and to, to use protocols that, that, um, that, that Joe and the team put in place to recruit animals and to convince their owners, because at the end of the day, this study would not happen unless owners were prepared to offer up their animals um, to, to be study participants and to agree to the terms of the study. And then, of course, 224 participating owners, absolutely critical. Um, uh, all owners that would have been on grass sickness premises, so they would have felt the pain of this disease at various times. Um, so it's terrific that um, they felt sufficient trust in the study team that they were prepared to allow their animals to be used for this study uh, for the advancement of our, our knowledge in equine grass sickness. Um, you can see the distribution of, uh, of study premises here. Um, again, the geographical distribution adds another element of complexity here. So we're not just talking about keeping things confined to a, a local area or a region, um, but this was very much nation nationwide, um, which makes it a, a, a real coordination challenge. And this is the, um, the schedule of, um, of vaccination, of treatments that were used for these animals. And the reason I show this slide um, is because um, there are multiple touch points here, multiple occasions when the study team were out with these animals, either collecting data um, or administering vaccines to these animals. So a huge task here for uh, the boots on the ground, the people who were actually going out and um, uh, administering vaccines, collecting data, which were essential for this study. And of course, all that had to be coordinated, um, not just by Joe, but by keeping consultation with referring veterinary practices as well, um, and uh, making sure that all the data was coming in and that was being um, securely archived for future analysis. Um, these, this is um, a list of some of the many people who were involved. Um, and you can see here ranging from uh, uh, veterinary surgeons to um, the veterinary medicines directorate who were absolutely uh, critical in providing uh, an animal test certificate for this vaccine which had not been used in horses previously. Many of those people are in the room today so uh, great to see you all here. And this is just my final slide. This slide I think really nicely makes the point that this study was only possible because of funding that came from multiple sources. Um, I, I can't remember the total cost of this project, but you can imagine from the scale and the duration this project ran over several years that this was expensive to fund. Um, it probably wasn't £100 million like the European One Health project, um, but still this is going to run into many hundreds of thousands of pounds to run this sort of study. And um, what 
Joe and Richard and the team and the uh, Equine Grass team was funded very successfully was to bring together multiple funding sources. Um, so multiple funders were able to make a contribution um, towards the development of this study and that large pot was then available for, uh, for, the, for the conduct, the successful uh, conduct of this particular um, study. So that's all I have to say about working in partnership. Um, I hope there were some illuminating and interesting examples there. Um, if we've got time, Chair, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Chris, for such an interesting talk and showing the, the power of collaboration and bringing people together. So we have got time for one or two quick questions, if anyone has a question for Chris. No, you've all... Uh, oh, sorry. Thank you, really. Chris, just on the vaccine trial, I mean, obviously, it was an extraordinary sort of undertaking and didn't have the outcome that we wanted. But if, if there was another 100 million, if there was another million, I mean, would, would we do another vaccine trial? Do you know, I'm going to reserve judgment on that until I've heard the talks later on today. <laughs> um, but it's certainly a possibility. Yeah, I mean, um, whilst, whilst no efficacy was was demonstrated with this particular vaccine. Um, that doesn't mean it wasn't effective. We were just then unable to demonstrate in this particular study. There might be other vaccines that are slightly different in the way they work. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I'd be, I'm not the expert on this, Rowley. I'd be really interested to hear uh, Joe's view on this, uh, Richard's, and I think Ian's talking about this a little bit later as well. So, yeah, I'd be interested. Yeah. I think Ian had a question. Yes, yeah, sorry, Ian. No, it was, it was to avoid too much discussion because we are going to cover that in quite a lot of detail. That's fine. Good. I haven't Great. got my foot in it then. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Well, um, thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. And and Chris is around obviously all day, but I've said he talks. And as Ian said, but I think the vaccine trial will come up again um, during the next group of presentations. So um, I'd just like to thank both of our plenary speakers very much for excellent presentations to set up the day. Um, and we're going to move straight on to our next session, which is focusing a bit more on gathering the evidence um, about grass sickness. So it's my Great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, who is a friend and colleague, Beth Wells, who works here at Morden. Um, Beth came to do her PhD at Morden and she never left, as she said. Her, her interest in uh, knowledge exchange has led her to a dual role at Morden, where she's working in the knowledge exchange area um, and also doing scientific research. Um, she's leading the project at the Morden at the moment, looking at equine grass sickness, um, where she's really encouraging this interdisciplinary thinking. Um, Beth, is, as all of you who know Beth, has got a lifelong interest in horses and everything equine. Um, combined with her scientific curiosity, she's making fantastic contribution uh, to this disease. Um, so Beth, my great pleasure to introduce you. So yes, um, thank you very much, Lee, first of all, and uh, welcome everybody. I am just so delighted to have got you all in one room and you really are not getting out till we've got some <clears throat> really good collaborations to move forward with. So firstly, thank you so much to the keynote speakers. I found those both really inspirational and really does reflect what we are trying to do here, and that is be totally inclusive. There's no idea as a stupid idea. Um, and there's nobody that we don't want to include in our in our project. So I'm going to just talk a little bit today <coughs> about <coughs> our part in that and the the um, the fellowship project that came out of it. So for those of you that know Morden will know that we have a long standing interest in equine grass sickness right back to the 1920s when when we were born ourselves and when it became a real issue in farm horses. And that was our real role into it was these were livestock in those days, they were dying, you know, what was the problem? And there was a lot of work done um, right up to, to present where we had a little gap and then we had a delegation from the British Horse Society came to see us um, and really rattled our cage a little bit about, you know, what was happening, what were you doing? Um, and there had been some royal questions about how, how, this, um, you know, how this was going forward. And so the fellowship project was born. And I'm going to just talk to you today a little bit about 
the updates on the biobank and the database, how they came about, the longitudinal studies and the importance of those studies that we've done, the research crucible with its outputs, and then how we take the research forward, which is where we are now and what today is all about. And I think we have a great opportunity today with you all captive um, together. So first of all, um, I really want to thank Dr. Cathy Geer, who was our first fellow and unfortunately went back to Germany at the end of the year. But Cathy was really instrumental in setting about setting up the biobank, which was actually a much bigger job than we thought. We thought, how difficult can this be? But we, we were wrong. Um, so basically this came about because there wasn't really a documented set of samples available for any researcher in grass sickness um, to, to get hold of. Um, and along with that, the database is equally as important because that is the owner's view of what happened to that horse on the run up. That's all the information that we really need to have and to be able to analyse. Um, it's not just about what happened on that day, it was the run up to the day. So the biobank comprises of a range of different samples from horse samples, um, case and controls, anti-mortem and post-mortem, environmental samples, so pasture and soil, um, climatic data and geographical data, and, and Haley will talk a little bit about her master's um, project in this later. And really important, as I said, the, the questionnaire data, which is also surveillance data and, and feeds into the UK equine surveillance. So I'll just rattle through the biobank really quickly about what we're, what we're after here, what we're looking for and why. So the biological samples come mainly from equine grass sickness cases, but we're also obviously very interested in field controls and premise controls um, and in grass sickness from uh, in cases from other, other countries as well as the UK. And the two post-mortem tissue types we're after are the autonomic ganglia and the ileum. Um, and I really want to thank Professor Elspeth Milne for her role in this. Without Elspeth, we couldn't have done any of this. And even though she's retired, she still does our um, samples for us. And these samples come back into the biobank once Elspeth is finished with them, because we're also very interested in what we can do with these samples in terms of um, RNA analysis later on. We have a fee available for vets to do this, so it doesn't cost either the horse owner or the vet. And I think that's really important. Uh, this biobank was funded totally by the British Horse Society and huge thanks to them. They funded it for three years. We're just about to start our third year. That's allowed us to make a really good comprehensive collection, but not only that, have all this backup data with it um, available for, for researchers. Um, the anti-mortem samples, we've got banks of bloods and um, also um, RNA secured blood, which is really important, saliva, uh, faecal and urine samples when we can get them. So again, these are all being processed, catalogued, stored at Morden and are, are now available. So we've been going for two years, which I could hardly believe for a start, because it's been a really quick two years. Um, during that time, we've had lots of feedback from the veterinary practices involved. So the sample packs have been improved, it's been made easier for them. The distribution has been extended. Um, now, over 60 UK vets practices actually we've got more than that now, I think, referral centres and hospitals right from Shetland down to Kent. So that's massive and we can only really thank, thank the vets for their particip participation here. We've had 94 cases officially reported and we know this is just the, the, the tip of the iceberg. Um, samples from 62 cases have been donated and post-mortem tissue samples from 43 horses. And this is something we'd really like to discuss further today. How do we make this more acceptable to horse owners to post-mortem their horses for these samples? How we make it easier for the vets to collect them and the, and the practical issues around that? So that's something I'm really interested in what the audience um, have to say about that. So we currently have over 1,500 samples in the biobank. And that includes the environmental samples. So we have a collaboration with the James Hutton Institute and all of our soil samples are being stored um, in the Scottish Soil Archive in Aberdeen. So I'm not going to say too much about the questionnaire data because it's very early days for this, but we have over 30 questions in this questionnaire. It's really comprehensive. 
we've tried not to be leading with the questions so the owners can answer as truthfully as, as they know and they can. But we're, we're pretty much agreeing with the data that's been collected previously on the age prevalence, on the survival rates, um, but also on premises that have been affected. Now, it's, it's quite interesting because as interesting entities, you know, they, they are good as single entities, but what we really need to be doing now is a multivariate analysis because a lot of these factors are going to depend on each other. So, for example, everybody says forage protects the horse. So our results to date from about 90 cases would suggest that half of those horses actually had forage on the lead up to the disease, um, at least up to a month beforehand. But then when we delved into that, the next question was, did you feed concentrates? 75% of these people that fed forages also fed concentrates. Now, I'm very interested to speak to Chris because your hypothesis is very similar to what we've sketched out on our microbiome group, looking at what the horse has been fed and the reaction to that horse from diet. Um, so that, these are definitely areas of interest. This is early days. If we've got an expert in multivariate analysis, please come and speak to me because I am most certainly not. Um, but that, that, that'll provide some really, oh joy, well done. <laughs> so the next part, I'm going to, am I going to be slow here, Lee? So the next part and a really important part of the biobank and as a study in its own right are the longitudinal studies. Um, I really want to thank World Horse Welfare for this. Without them, this would not have happened. And in particular, our colleagues Eileen and Caroline, who are here from Bellwade, who have a really rough time of it. They're right in the middle of a big grass sickness area. They have lots of horses coming out and in. You can imagine it's an ideal scenario. Um, so they were generous enough to allow us access to their whole premises for really over a year. So every month we would trot up and annoy them. And all their staff were really brilliant at collecting samples and um, things, tricky things like urine samples, um, which gave us lots of laughs in between times. So we've got all those samples monthly for just over a year. They're all now in the biobank. In amongst those samples, they did have cases and amongst those sample taking. So what we have there is really, as you can imagine, a really important sample set on the lead up to disease within that field where the disease occurred, comparing to the other fields, there's just absolutely no end of what can be done um, with those samples. Um, our second study site is Balmoral Estate and Sylvia Ormiston, the stud manager, is here today. And again, we've got the same welcome there. Sylvia had a, a, a sort of cluster of cases quite a few years back now. But again, a very interesting premise because of that and also because of what Sylvia has done in terms of mitigation. And has that meant she now hasn't had cases? We hope that's the case, but these also will be very interesting samples. Again, looking at microbiome, looking at Sylvia's mitigation strategies um, for feeding. So that brings us to the third part of the fellowship, which is the equine grass sickness crucible. Now, Lee's told you a little bit about this, and yes, to be honest, it sounds really peculiar on the face of it, but it is something that universities use a lot to crack difficult, um, really difficult questions where we need a lot of different input from a lot of different experts. And of course, you know, grass sickness is an obvious one. You know, we're looking at soils, we're looking at pasture and climate, and you know, one person can't be an expert in all that as well as the animal itself. So we brought in about 30 scientists. These were very much interdisciplinary. But they were all experts in a field that was related, we felt, to grass sickness. Um, and also they were using the very newest technologies in their own area of research. And we also thought this was really important. So again, we locked them up for a day. Um, we were very lucky to have Simon Cousins, who's also here today, um, to steer us through and facilitate the ideas. We gave them the very basics and then we let them loose on their thoughts. Um, how, how would they tackle this? What questions would they ask? Where are the gaps? And not really surprisingly, but it was very nice to have it confirmed, they came up with four areas that we were very interested in anyway. Um, and I'll just very briefly go through where we are now with, with those four areas. So the microbiome obviously is a big area that Chris also has touched on and something that 
in, in, in equine research is not as well developed as it is in livestock research. So we've formed a project group with lots of interdisciplinary help from particularly SRUC and the James Hutton Institute. We've um, drafted a pilot project um, and, and that's re really ready to run. I'm not going to say much about environmental factors because Haley is going to fill us in on what she's been doing, but she's got a fantastic project going with some really interesting results to date. We have an undergraduate also working on catchment mapping alongside Haley, really feeding into what she's doing. And we've been discussing um, a soil eDNA project with the James Hutton Institute where all the soil samples are being held. And that again will feed into the microbiome project because we're really keen to do horse and environment in tandem. We think that's that's really important. And again, I'm not going to say anything about the in vitro systems because we have our modern expert in that, uh, Dr. David Smith, who's one of our fellows, is going to cover this um, under session two. But this is a really exciting area of research. And I think for grass sickness particularly so, because we can't recreate this disease. You know, we're totally reliant on field studies and field samples. But David may have a way around this and he will, I'm sure, tell you more about it in the next session. And Chris mentioned immunology and that was brought up very quickly by the immunologists at the Crucible. There are gaps here and um, there are interesting work that could be done. And we are actually in collaboration with Chris and Joy at the moment. They've done some really interesting work on, on biomarkers and we would like to, to progress that. We've also worked a lot in Morden and disease research with transcriptomics. Again, we have the expertise in house for that and we're very keen to look at developing immunological signatures um, for cases and controls. So these are all really interesting projects that are all sort of just about um, just to be started. What we have got running at the moment and Cathy set up just before she left was a proteomics um, project with um, our proteomics group, which is headed by Kevin McLean, who is here today. So anybody that's got a proteomics question, I'm going to immediately point you in his direction. Um, but Kevin essentially has got a really state of the art new mass spec machine, which is much more sensitive than previous versions. And what he's been doing is been taking case sera. We've been albumin depleting it so we can he can actually use it. And Kevin doesn't like sera, so he's scowling at the moment. Um, and horse sera is particularly bad, I think. So um, he's been then look, putting this through his mass spec and looking at what's coming out. So what are the components of that? case sera, it's a horse that died of grass sickness. And he has about 75,000 hits, which he's currently working through. And the next step would be to control that, to, to control sera from a horse that, that was healthy. And just to keep Kevin happy and on side, we're going to optimise this for equine urine samples. And again, that is a collaboration with Surrey and with Joy's work on equine urine biomarkers that she'll be talking about a little later on. So our forward plan, so it's definitely working together. We're very keen to be as inclusive as we can, as I said, of within research and out with research. We are in the middle of our recruitment process for our new researcher um, and they will be really concentrating on those pilot projects that I've outlined. And um, that's happening at the moment. That pilot data will be then to use to submit funding applications with our collaborators. So what we really need is to run the pilots get the preliminary results and then we've got something to work with. We are continuing the biobank. I've taken that over um, since Cathy's left, so that is that is continuing and we're, we're still adding samples to that and the data. Increase our networks we're always interested in, so again, MD with any good ideas for that is very welcome. And to continue to raise awareness. Now, this has been really central to the project for us, was to really um, stimulate horse owners and um, the veterinary industry, the pharma industries to help us here because we, we, we clearly do all need to work together. And this year the whole team and it wasn't at all just me, it was a massive team from the Equine Grass Sickness Fund with Kate and Anne and um, lots of volunteers. Um, we even had Lorraine coming with our Clydesdale Survivor to one of several of our events actually. All that makes a difference. It definitely makes a difference. And, and that's how we need to work. So I'd just like to thank everybody that's been involved with that from the superb support, uh, support we've had. And I'm just going to leave you with that because 
that to me kind of encapsulates what we're trying to do here. And those are, they're not all of them because not all the VETS practices are on there. So I'm really sorry if I'm about to offend someone, but well, there you go. But it is a good lot of the, um, the practices, the industries, and everybody else who's, who's helped us and funded us today. So I can only thank you very much. And I really look forward to today to hearing what everybody else is doing and seeing how we can we can work together. Thank you. No, you're very good. And thank you very much, Beth, for a great talk. And I think that last slide sort of summed it all up of the massive amount of work and collaboration from everyone. Um, is there any, are there any quick questions for Beth? Um, if I can ask a quick one, Beth, it was, um, you mentioned about the biobank that you also have data from the horse owners survey. And I wondered how important is that? for the grass sickness research. Yeah, I think, yes, thanks Lee. I think that that is incredibly important. Um, the more data we can collect all around the disease as well as on the disease itself, I think will will definitely give us lots of clues to the risk factors. And the risk factors are obviously really important here. And for the horse owners, I realise that's the information you want. You want to know what those are. And it's really important we can back that up with enough data. So we, we, we've had data and the Grass Thickness Fund have been collecting this for years and years. What we really want to do is push that further. The new questionnaire is much more comprehensive than we've had in the past. Um, and also we need, we need more, we need more people responding. So every answer we get to that adds to the strength of that um, analysis when it comes along. And of course we need an expert analysis and anal analyzer to do it. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Beth. Um, so we're moving on to our next speaker, and it's my huge pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Elspeth Milne, um, who probably doesn't need much of an introduction to all of you, but Elspeth graduated from the Dick Vet, where she's worked as an equine clinician there um, from 1986 to 1996. And that's where she developed her initial interest in grass sickness, particularly on the management pathology side. Elspeth became Head of Veterinary Pathology um, at the Dick Vet from 2004 to 2019. Um, as Beth mentioned, um, Elspeth retired in 2022, but she still continues her equine grass sickness research. Um, she has over 130 research publications, of which 42 are on equine grass sickness. So, Elspeth, my pleasure to introduce you. And that's your follow back and going to hear this in the top. Great. Thanks very much, Lee. Um, and thanks very much to the organisers for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm really going to enjoy the day, at least once I've done the talk, I will. So uh, I'm going to describe the results of a, a small study that we carried out last year, which was a study of lipofuscin in the neurons with age and an equine grass sickness, which kind of made grammatical sense when I wrote it, but I'm not sure that it does now. But anyway. Um, this was mainly carried out by Lydia Tan, who's not here today, but she is. She was a, at the time a, a final year veterinary student at the Dick Vet down the road and um, now qualified. And she was a recipient of the John Gilmer Summer Research Scholarship from the Equine Grass Sickness Fund to allow this to take place. Now, it was quite a small study, as you'll see, and it was limited by the fact that she had to fit it into the time that she had available, really. So what is lipofuscin to start with? Um, lipofuscin is a pigment that forms yellow brown granules when we use our usual stain for pathology, which is the H&E uh, stain. And we can see it there within, within the neurons, this kind of brownish sort of yellowy brown kind of material. Um, and it in, it's known to increase with age in humans and also laboratory animals of some other species. And for that reason, it's sometimes called the aging pigment. It, con it consists of insoluble um, material that contains lipid and it accumulates within the cytoplasm of degenerating neurons. Um, but also in some neurodegenerative diseases, for example, in humans at least, 
for example, Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, it also builds up within neurons and some other um, tissues as well. In horses, it's known to increase in the central nervous system in older horses, although it's not actually been quantified as far as we can tell, um, but also in equine motor neuro disease, which is quite interesting as well. It doesn't seem to have been quantified in the equine autonomic um, neurons or in equine grass sickness. When uh, lipofuscin accumulates within neurons, it causes oxidative stress and an increase in apoptosis or programmed cell death. It's also known that um, lipofuscin positive neurons have fewer dendrites, the little branching structures coming off uh, the main cell body of the neuron, uh, conducting electrical impulses, um, and also reduced neurotransmitter production, which we know is a, a feature of grass sickness. So we just wondered whether this uh, accumulation, if it were to accumulate in grass sickness, whether it might be relevant to some of the pathological changes. So the aims of the study were to assess the effect of age on lipofuscin in autonomic neurons of horses with and without grass sickness, and to determine whether there were any differences in the amount present in acute, subacute and chronic grass sickness um, compared with control horses. And of course, the acute, subacute and chronic would be in stages of increasing duration and severity, uh, decreasing severity. So we um, had five groups of horses in the study, eight in each group, eight acute grass sickness, eight subacute, eight chronic, and then we had 16 controls, eight of which were young, and uh, there was no significant difference from their ages and those of the grass sickness cases, and eight old ones, which were older than all the other groups. And this was obviously to take into account the, the age factor. So we obtained from our archives at the vet school sections of cranial cervical ganglion from the just from the back of the head that we collected at post-mortem examinations previously, and we stained them with Schwarl stain for lipofuxin pigment. Even though you can see them on the standard stain, that shows up better really for image analysis on the Schmoll stain. Um, so we took images that, uh, under the microscope at three random points per section, and these were averaged for the uh, to obtain the results per animal. So there were two different measurements that we made, and these I'll, I'll be referring to several times later on. We counted the number of positively and negatively staining and neurons to work out the percentage that were positive, regardless of how much lipofuscin uh, they had in them. So that was our percentage positive cells. We also measured the percentage of the area of each neuron that was positive for lipofuscin, percentage positive area. And that gives a kind of surrogate, I suppose, for the quantity present. We didn't directly measure lipofuscin, but um, that gives us an idea of the quantity present. And that's just an example of one of the images. You can see there, uh, the blue there uh, in the neurons is the lipofuscin right there. And there's a couple of negative ones that don't have any in it. Um, I won't go into this in detail really, but Lydia has spent a lot of her time actually analyzing, using the an um, image analysis to analyze the, these sections. And we used two different systems for uh, with the image analysis. One was to count the neurons that were positive, and then we also undertook a kind of uh, training system for the for the image analysis in order to get it to recognise what we were after. And we had to give a kind of um, false colour to these neurons and to the background in order to create a contrast. So that's where this came in here. And this allowed us to, to work out the percentage of each neuron that was positive for the lack of skin. So onto the results. 
this uh, graph shows the age along the bottom and the number of positive neurons, percentage positive neurons up the side on the y-axis. And uh, we've just divided them into groups. So each in individual mark is an individual animal that we have there. And we can see that there appears to be an increase with age, putting all the groups together. You can see that there is actually a correlation with age. I'll show you the statistics on that in a minute. However, one thing that is, they seem quite scattered across it really in their different groups, but one thing that does jump out a little bit there is perhaps the fact that there's a lot of chronic grass sickness cases, which were the green marker there. I'm not sure it's quite what's happened to my, uh, to my legend there, but these were the chronic grass sickness cases. There's a few further down too, but you can see that there is a bit of a group grouping here, which seems to have quite a lot of Lycofuscan cell, number of cells for the age. But overall, there was a trend of increasing Lycofuscan neurons with age. So this was just going on to the quantity now, the area of, that was covered with, of, of each neuron that was covered with Lycofuscan. And again, there is a correlation with age, maybe not quite so obvious. So just to summarise that, when we combine the controls together, the old and the young controls, and looked at the correlation, there was a significant correlation between age and those two parameters that we've been talking about. Likewise, when you combine the grass sickness groups and look at the correlation, there's also a significant correlation between age and um, the two parameters. Oops, apologies. We also looked at this in a slightly different way. We just, these are the medians and the interquartile ranges there. Acute grass sickness, subacute, chronic, and then the young and old controls. And we looked at statistically whether there was any difference between these groups when they were lumped together like that. Um, we've got the percentage positive area. I haven't shown the data for the, um, for the number of neurons, but it was fairly similar. But you can see that there's a significant difference here between the young controls and the old controls in the percentage positive area. We would expect that from the previous graphs, actually. So it just kind of um, backs that up. And there was a very nearly significant uh, difference between the chronic grass sickness cases and the young controls as well. You can see it appears to be higher here in the in the chronic grass sickness cases. It wasn't, didn't quite reach statistical significance, but there is a, appear to be a trend there. And as I say, fairly similar results for the, um, for the number of neurons as well. Uh, we, we then finally divide, subdivided um, the results. So we've got uh, subdivided the groups of, of I mean to say, so we've got the different, sorry about this. Well, I think I should just put this down actually. <laughs> not, not, not making much of it. Um, yes, I'm a bit of liability with this today. So um, you can see that we've got, this time we've got the, the different groups subdivided into their ages. And as you can see, these numbers along here are individual, are the number of animals in each actual bar. So as we get higher up into the older age groups, we've got very few, and some of these are n equals one. So I'm not pretending that we can conclude too much from this. We have to be a little bit careful not to overinterpret this. But um, going on to percentage positive neurons, you can see that there does appear to be a trend towards more lipofooks in in each age group in the chronic grass sickness cases. Now, per perhaps if we concentrate on this one on the left hand side here, the youngest age group, you can see for their age, the chronic grass sickness cases seem to have more percentage positive neurons than, for example, the controls of that age and the other grass sickness groups. Similarly, when we looked at um, the percentage positive area, 
you can see that there's a, a very similar sort of trend going on there, which is quite interesting. And al although it was too small to do any statistical so, um, actual analysis on it, um, I think it was probably interesting enough just to show you that um, result that was obtained there. So looking at the effect of grass sickness status by age group, just to summarise, there seems to be a trend towards a larger percentage positive neurons and quantity of lipofuxin in the positive neurons in gra chronic grass sickness cases, taking age into account. But we do need a larger number of cases for statistical analysis. So lipofuxin does increase with neurons in age, both in grass sickness and in the control horses. And as I mentioned, there seems to be this trend for an increase in chronic grass sickness, regardless of age. But why would it be chronic grass sickness if this proves in a larger study to be correct? Well, first of all, lipofuscin takes time to accumulate, so it probably doesn't have time to accumulate in the acute and subacute cases. Also, a lot of the neurons will be lost in those more severe types of um, disease as well. So. It may be that sublethal injury to neurons in chronic grass sickness um, may allow accumulation to progress. So it's possible that chronic grass sickness cases have some metabolic changes due to lipofuscin that are similar to age related changes that we see. And these could be uh, or are likely to be an increase in oxidative stress, an increase in pro program cell death, and reduced neurotransmitter production. And I think a larger study on this um, is warranted. Finally, I'd just like to acknowledge the Equine Grass Sickness Fund for the John Gilmer Research Co uh, Scholarship. And I should actually maybe mention that John Gilmer himself was a, a very inspirational researcher working here at the Mordon. And he certainly inspired me as a young researcher back in the 1980s when I first started to work on grass sickness. Um, I'd like to also thank my colleagues in pathology at the Dick Vet who helped in various ways. Um, also the clinicians and owners for their care of the cases and perhaps critically um, for agreeing to post-mortem examinations to allow these tissues to be collected. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, um, Elspeth, for a fantastic talk uh, and for sticking um, brilliantly to time. Um, and I don't know if there's any quick questions for Elspeth. Sorry, yes. Uh, no, uh, we do have data on how long each, you know, what was the duration of each case at the time of death, but I can't recall that at the moment, but it would be more than seven days by definition. Yeah. Okay, any further questions? Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, sorry. Go back. Okay, I think yeah. it's a, I'll just. Um, I'll try and repeat the question just for the on is it were you asking um what would happen in foals or much younger um, or even before they're born? OK, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a good question, actually, and it's not something that we've actually looked at, um, but it would be quite interesting to know if they already have some accumulation of black of skin at that age. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you very much. I'm, I'm slightly hovering about introducing Bruce because I think the fire alarm's about to go off. But, <laughs> but in case the clock, in case the clock's not working accurately, um, it's my huge pleasure to um, introduce uh, Professor Bruce McGorham uh, to give the next talk. Um, Bruce graduated from the University of Edinburgh. Um, with a BSc in veterinary pathology and a veterinary degree with distinction. Um, he worked for three years in vet practice before returning to Edinburgh as the horse race betting levy board resident in equine respiratory diseases. 
and he obtained a PhD in equine respiratory disease. He currently provides specialist <coughs> medical care for horses referred uh, from all across Scotland and North England to the Dick Vet. And Bruce, I think, as you all know, has devoted a huge amount of his time and energy and his career to equine grass sickness. So it's a huge pleasure to have uh, Bruce here today. Devoted too much time, according to my wife and kids. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to uh, address two questions today. This is the first question here. Um, and this is the current hypothesis that we're working on at, at the Dick Vet just along the road. Uh, this is not new work. There's been a lot of interest in fungi right from the early 1900s when the first the, the, the disease was first identified. Then the late Gene Robb, Elspeth, Dave Doxey took it on in the 1990s. Uh, we're kind of revisiting it and applying some more modern technology. So the hypothesis is that at the time of a grass sickness outbreak, there's a bit of a warfare going on in the pasture. There's a biological war. The plants are growing gr rapidly in the early spring, early autumn, um, but they undergo some stresses, we think, and, and you know, dr drought. Um <laughs> OK, good. No, no worries, no worries. So, yeah, I think there's a warfare going on here and, and the plants will be under stress because of the weather factors, the drought and the cold weather that seems to trigger this disease. So they'll alter their metabolism so that horses are ingesting grasses that have different uh, uh, compositions. But also, if we look at the biofilm, the surface of the, the leaves on those grasses, we can see that they're colonised by large numbers of fungi, cyanobacteria, algae, diatoms. There's a whole range of biological agents growing on those and there'll be a competition to get a niche on, in, in that environment and all of these various um, uh, microorganisms will be producing protective molecules such as toxins to, to try and identify, you know, protect themselves and get a little niche to grow on those plants at the time. So we're interested in these microfungi, not the macrofungi, the microfungi that are growing in there and we can see them in larger numbers. When a horse ingests this grass, it's going to have altered grass composition and it's also going to be ingesting all of these wide range of microorganisms, not just fungi, but a whole range. And we're interested in mycotoxins. This is the kind of one of the protective warfare mechanisms that the, that the fungus uses to get a niche in this environment and try and protect itself and survive. And I think a strong possibility is that these mycotoxins, when they're in the intestine, might be one explanation for this profound alteration in the bacteria that we see in the gut that, that uh, Chris Proudman and Joyce Lang's group have, have identified and seems to be such a key focus that we should should consider. Many of our mycotoxins are, are have an antibiotic effect. Many of the antibiotics that we use in hospitals are fungal products, so it's likely that these fungal products could potentially devastate the, the microbiota down there and change it and may allow proliferation and overgrowth of clostridia, etc. So in addition to potentially altering the microbiome, many of these are neurotoxic and we propose that they also contribute to degeneration of the autonomic and the enteric nervous uh, and neurons that, that, that characterise grass sickness. So this is the hypothesis. Why are we not studying botulism? Because this seems to be the kind of favoured hypothesis just now. Well, I think there's quite a bit of evidence that says grass sickness is not caused by neurotoxins from botulism, but botulism does produce a number of different things and including the C2 and C3 toxins that Eden will allude to later. So there's, we've accumulated quite a bit of evidence here suggesting it's not neurotoxins. We do see neuromuscular botulism in horses, usually when they're exposed to poorly saved haylage or silage. It's a different disease. The clinical signs, the pathology are different. We can differentiate them quite easily. We've looked at the target cells the, the neuromuscular junctions, we've looked at the target proteins, the snare proteins, they're different in grass sickness from botulism. Ch experimental challenges using botulinum neurotoxins in horses and in rabbits don't produce grass sickness, they produce neuroparalytic botulism. So I think there's evidence suggesting don't look at the neurotoxins from botulism, but that doesn't preclude a role for these others that, that Ian will mention later. So we've moved on from this to mycotoxins, and I think this explains some of the risk factors potentially for grass sickness and why the disease was first reported in the 1906s. In, around about 1906, there was a huge change in agricultural productivity. There were a lot of drainage, fertilising, the change of grass and seed mixtures. It was previously meadows with a numerous plant species and then it, it became 
about five sort of different species. So a totally different change in the, the plants that were being growing, and it's possible that that predisposed the pastures to developing mycotoxins. This may explain premises factors. The location, the soil type are really important determinants of what fungi are on the premises. Is there a suitable environment on that premises to allow fungal growth? Season and weather. The, the fungal growth on plants is intimately linked with the, the, the plant growth phase and with weather, so that might explain the, 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 these factors here. Obviously, grazing, recent move, soil disturbance. Most of the fungi that are living on plants come from the soil, and maybe soil contamination of the plants because of disturbance is a risk factor. Chris mentioned earlier, feces on the pasture, higher so soil nitrogen. These are um, energy sources for fungi, and again, will we'll increase the number of fungi in the, the pasture potentially. Immunity is really important in how you deal with any toxin, and we've shown that there's also um, a, a, a quite a significant reduction in the sulfur amino acids in the serum of horses with this disease and also with cats that have the identical form. And, and these are really important in the detoxification of toxins, including mycotoxins. So I think there's some circumstantial evidence to, 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 to fit in with these risk factors. Can fungal mycotoxins also explain this, what we think is an identical disease in these other species? Well, clearly rabbits, hares, llamas, sheep, all are grazing, so they could get a pasture mycotoxicosis. One of the big risk factors for canine dysautonomia is access to pasture. Dogs that are tend to be wandering around pasture, so again, they could get access to pasture. Cats, we do see outbreaks of, in, of, of feline dysautonomia in housed cats that have no access to, to grass. So it can't be something that just lives on grass. If it's a fungus, it's got to be a fungus that can potentially live in cat food as well. So what evidence do we have to support this hypothesis? Well, we've looked at um, dietary fungi, and there's some previous work done this, and, and identified increased numbers of fungi on equine grass sickness grasses, quite a range of fungi. There was a lot of interest in the 90s for, for these two species here. They were identified in pastures in Patagonia and in Scotland, both of which have a high incidence of the disease. We've also had the luck to get some samples from an indoor outbreak of equine grass sickness in Hungary. Horses were not at pasture, they were just getting fed oats, hay and straw. Um, and we've identified a large fungal burden in all of these environmental samples. And we've looked at feline dysautonomia samples, cat food, and again, you know, there's a, there's a wide range of fungi present on those. We've also looked inside the horse at the gut content, and we've showed that the horses with grass sickness have an increased abundance, diversity, and prevalence of a wide range of fungi. We used a metagenomics approach, large number of samples analyzed, um, unfortunately, we didn't find any single likely causal fungus. We did find a large number of fungi that were heavily, you know, strongly associated with grass sickness. Again, questionable role in this disease. Is this cause or is it just a non-causal factor? Um, these were all environmental microfungi. Saprotrophs, that's fungi that live in dung, soil, plants, break down organic matter. Some plant pathogens and some endophytes. These are fungi that live intimately within the plant and kind of live in a symbiotic relationship uh, typically with, with plants. So quite a wide range of things. One of the common factors with many of these though was they were what are termed extremophiles. These are fungi that are very resistant. They can survive in adverse conditions much better than other fungi. So this is maybe allowing them to overgrow under these adverse circumstances like the drought and the cold snaps on the surface of grass, hence the, the, their presence in the, great, the, the, the grass sickness horses. And many of these produce cytotoxins and neurotoxins. There are some historic experimental fungal challenges, trying to induce take fungi, fungi from the pasture, instill them by intragastric in, uh, intubation into horses to try and induce the disease. None of these were effective. They did induce some neurological diseases, but it was clearly different from grass sickness. We've also looked at mycotoxins. This is kind of ongoing work, and again, as you would expect, given that there's a lot of fungi in these samples, there's a wide range of mycotoxins. Um, some from Fusarium, which is one of the um, interesting uh, fungi potentially because it contains, it produces a lot of neurotoxins. So we found increased mycotoxins in grass sickness plants, in the gut from horses and, and, and cats with the disease, in all of these samples from the indoor outbreak in Hungary. But again, no single clear causal neuro uh, mycotoxin identified. So this is ongoing work. 
This is our focus just now, but it is challenging. Huge range of mycotoxins. Analysis is challenging. Some are rapidly metabolized. Maybe they're coming gone by the time we get the samples. And we have some what are termed mask myco mycotoxins, where the mycotoxin binds to something like a protein in the body, and it, it kind of prevents you from identifying it easily. So this is ongoing work that um, um, is the focus of our interest just now. The second question I'd like to address is this, um, just to, trying to raise this, this possibility when we're trying to look at future, future avenues today, is what can we learn from human neurodegenerative disease research? And I think there's some significant overlaps with many of these really devastating diseases that many of you will be familiar with. Many of these are un unknown. There are some genetic causes of this, but most of them are unknown cause, despite the high prevalence, the significant impact in human health, and despite the huge global research effort. So this gives us me a little bit of comfort in that I don't think we should be too self-critical that we haven't found the cause of grass sickness, given that there are these really significant diseases that we still don't know the cause of. But can we tap into this and, and benefit our own research? So let's consider, compare and contrast these diseases. There are clearly some clear differences, so they're not the same diseases. We don't get, a, in humans, we don't get a similar or, or pr pretty much an identical disease. The age of onset is, is very different. Grass sickness is a disease that tends to affect younger horses predominantly. These degenerative diseases affect old age and the prevalence increases with age. The time course is different. Grass sickness is a relatively acute disease. We don't think it's progressive. Human diseases are chronic and they're progressive. They get worse with age. And the anatomical location of neurodegeneration, the resultant symptoms are different. The, the focus for the human research is largely central signs, dementias, memory loss, motor function, etc. We don't really see that predominantly in, in our horses. But there are common features that I think it, it means that we should give them some consideration. Most of the diseases contain or, or have a component of enteric and autonomic neurodegeneration, including chromatolysis. This is an enteric neuron from a, uh, from a person, I should say, with Parkinson's disease showing what would just be identical to grass sickness chromatolysis. So this seems to be something that's not recognized as much. It's not a focus of human research. They tend to focus on the central effects, but this is a significant um, component of many of these diseases and a significant influence of kind of patient quality of life. They all have common mechanisms contributing to neurodegeneration. We've identified these four key mechanisms that contribute to these human diseases present in grass sickness. And as we've been talking, they're all associated with altered GI microbiota. Both the bacteria and the fungi in the gut of people with these diseases change. And the, there's, a, there's a real drive just now to thinking that this disease, the neurodegeneration and the clinical consequences start in the gut and then progress to the central nervous system. So the gut signs can start several years before people present then with more kind of classical central signs. And that's thought to be explained by this, what they term the gut-brain axis. So this, this uh, is, is illustrated in this cartoon. Here's the brain here, and this is what, you know, most of the human research, um, and, and, and when we think about these diseases, this is what we're thinking about is, is central disease. This is the gut here, and these are some cartoons kind of highlighting a high-powered view of the gut. And here's this very surface, the, the high-powered view of the surface lining of the gut, showing the villi, and here's the, the gut microbiota, the bacteria, the fungi, and here are the nerves. The nerve endings are very close to these gut microbiota. And the thought is that there's some toxin coming from this microbiota because it's disturbed, and that's entering these enteric neurons. So they're suffering, they're undergoing neurodegeneration, and then that's spreading up through one of these pathways. There's multiple kind of pathways that these can travel up through from the gut up to the central nervous system and cause pathology up here. So this is the progression. If you look at people, they have pathology in here several years before they have pathology up here in many instances. And we think the same thing's probably happening in grass sickness, but on a much quicker scale. So here's the, some GI dysfunction, Parkinson's disease, just to highlight how important this is. And it seems to be, to me, a little bit neglected, but they, they develop loss of taste and smell. That contributes to appetite. We know there are some dysfunctions in this in grass sickness cases as well. Humans, high frequency of drooling, we get this in our grassers as well. We've always wondered, does it increase saliva production or is it lack of swallowing? In humans, they actually produce less saliva, but because there's less swallowing, 
the saliva pools and the drool. So this is maybe happening in our graft sickness cases as well. There's dysphagia, oral pharyngeal esophageal dysphagia. Again, and because people can report this, they can tell us what the, what the perceived problem is. And it seems, seems very like what we perceive as happening in graft sickness cases. People can fairly well get the food into the back of the mouth, which then should normally initiate the complex swallowing to push that into the esophagus and open up the, 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 the anterior esophageal sphincter. That, but, but, in, in, but in these patients, that seems to block that, that, that when the food passes to the back of the throat, it seems to not initiate that swelling complex. And I think that's probably what's happening in the, in the grass sickness cases as well. Dysmotility of the esophagus, gastroesophageal reflux, we see that as well. Delayed stomach emptying, abdominal discomfort, postprandial bloating, early satiety. I think again, we see some of our grass sickness cases, they go to eat, they eat a little bit and then they stop. Is this because they're getting early satiety or, or, or um, postprandial bloating perhaps? Nausea, they get weight loss as a consequence. Small intestine, dilated bloating again, problems defecating, megacolon constipation. So you, you can see a real clear parallel between these GI signs in Parkinson's patients and in our grass sickness cases. So last slide, there's a real interest in the role of the microbiota, both fungi and, and um, bacteria in these human neurodegenerative cases. A lot of people are thinking that's where the disease starts and then progresses centrally, so that's where we should be looking. There's a huge amount of research going on. A lot of publications have just copied some of these, and I think that should be something we should consider uh, when we're wondering where to, how to progress. So the take home messages are role of fungi, research ongoing, but also we should, I think, increase our understanding of grass sickness if we carefully extrapolate. There are different diseases, so we've got to do any extrapolation really carefully, but there's a vast body of information and research in there that we can maybe tap into. Um, and thanks for your interest. Well, thank you very much, Bruce, for a really fascinating talk and lots of really interesting ideas there. Um, does anyone, sorry, Bruce has run off, but has anyone got a quick question for Bruce? <laughs> okay. Um, if I could ask you a quick one, Bruce, because I know we're going to short of time. You mentioned that the disease occurs in other countries. Would you would you able to say a bit more about that, where it's, where it's else it's occurred? Yes, so the disease, obviously, the highest prevalence is in Scotland. The, the, there are a greater number in England. Um, it's the kind of... Sorry, Bruce, could you come up to the mic? Sorry, it's just that we've got online people too. Yeah, yeah. So, thank you. So, yeah, yeah high, highest, highest kind of prevalence in Scotland, greater number of cases in England, uh, UK-wide, um, but it seems to kind of blanket an area in the northern part of the northern hemisphere, as it were, and then in a kind of mirror image in the southern part of the southern hemisphere, down in Patagonia, Chile, um, Argentina, some bits in Bolivia as well. So it kind of misses out that central equator part, I think. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, thank you. Sorry, thank you. Thank you very much, Bruce. Um, so a great pleasure to introduce. We've got a, a, um, a double act next as our, our next presentation. Um, Professor Ian Poxton and Dr. Leona Leone Hunter, um, and I think the two of you are going to do this as joint presentation. Um, so my uh, great pleasure to introduce Ian. Ian is the Professor Emeritus um, at University of Edinburgh, and he is a specialist in bacteriology and host response to infection. Um, Ian was head of microbiology at the University of Edinburgh from 2001 to 2005, and he's chaired many international groups and was given a Lifetime Achievement Award by the Anaerobe Society of the Americas. Um, he's been a stalwart um, equine grass sickness fund committee for almost 20 years um, and he's recently stepped down from the committee. He's published uh, over 200 papers um, and 14 of these have been on equine grass sickness. Um, what I'll do is I'll also introduce uh, Leone to you so that the two of them can do a seamless um, presentation. Um, so Leone has been intrigued by grass sickness for quite a long time now, since she was an undergrad, and she researched the role of Clostridium botulinum type C in equine grass sickness and on her PhD at the University of Edinburgh. Um, she subsequently moved to work in biotech and she's working currently in public health. Um, and Leone has also been a member of the grass sickness committee um, since 2019. So Ian, if you'd like to start off, and I think Leone will follow. Thank you. Um, and it's just, that's your point to okay. it. Okay. okay. Right, many thanks, Lee. Um, yeah, I've been retired, what, 10 years now, almost uh, to the day. Um, 
And I'm just thinking the last time I stood here, I think was in 2008. And I did have to say your majesty to uh, or whatever or whatever I was taught to say to, to Princess Anne. So uh, I don't need to say that to Anne Logan, of course. Um, <laughs> but 2008, it's a long time since I was last year, but it, things haven't necessarily stood still. Anyhow, this is our topic. And uh, as Lee says, Lee and he'll take over about three quarters of the way through to finish it off, or at least I'm going to finish the final bit. I could sit down and say just yes, that's the that's that's my answer to this question, but I better give a little bit of evidence before I do that. So we've heard a lot about this already this morning. Um, historical evidence. We've heard about Tocker in the early 1900s. He was based in Aberdeen. I think he was a very astute microbiologist or vet. He, he knew a lot about botulism. In fact, he was partly responsible for diagnosing a very, very infamous case of uh, cases of botulism in Loch Marie in, in the, the 1900s. So he was very, very aware of botulism. I'll mention some of our work that Leonie was very, uh, very much responsible for. Um, I suppose it's 20 plus years ago now uh, on toxin detection and serology. I'll mention Helen McCarthy's work when she was working with Chris uh, in Liverpool. Uh, this was a, a very important study. And I'll, well, this is more Leonie's point. She'll talk about the what, were there any pointers for the efficacy of this present vaccine study? So 100 years ago, we've heard this already. I'm not sure if it was 1907 or Bruce, I think said 1906. Quite a long time ago that grass sickness was recognised in Scotland. And it was the early work of uh, Tocker and co-workers. He then said it was caused by Bacillus botulinos, so it changed genus name, it changed sex at that time. It's now Clostridium botulinum. They managed to culture the, the organism from horses and they showed an antibody response to it, something that we did many, many years later. And they did what they termed the first vaccine trial. And in 1923-24, a botulinum vaccine trial was performed in over 1400 horses. And again, Chris mentioned it. And I think, and I, I could be mistaken, but you mentioned Welcome, uh, Sir Henry Welcome. Well, I think this vaccine was actually produced by Burroughs Welcome, this uh, initial vaccine in 1923. So there was a link to the, the Welcome Trust as we now know it then. The results were very promising. I'm not going to analyze the results. Uh, I think if the vaccine trial that we did, well, I'm saying we, I don't really include myself in that, but uh, the vaccine trial that was done recently, if that had had the same sort of results that Tocker's vaccine trial had, we would have been very, very pleased with the results. But his work was largely discredited. I think it was something very political. It wasn't very scientific. I think there was an ex-director of the Morden Institute who was involved in the, the anti to, to Tocker. Anyhow, the studies were more or less forgotten about for the next 70 years or so. And then some people with, well, one person we've already heard of was, uh, was Jean Robb. She, I knew Jean from when I was doing my PhD. She was uh, working in the, the same building at the time, but she came to see me in 1993. She knew I had interests in Clostridia not Clostridium botulinum much in those days, but she approached me and said, was equine grass sickness caused by, by, uh, by Clostridium botulinum? Jean had, as we've heard from Bruce, had spent a lot of time working on, the on fungal toxins and she decided that they weren't important. She was using very, very she would, she would be the first to agree, very primitive techniques in those days. It was very much a culture approach, but she decided that microtoxins weren't to be followed and she should maybe direct us towards Tocker's work. And coincidentally, within a few weeks, it seems like Keith Miller, who I don't know if any of you know, I know he was very much uh, prominent on grass sickness research around about then. He came to see me. He was a, a vet, an animal nutritionist. He he was a very good reader of the historical literature and had del delved very deeply into Tocker's work. 
and he was convinced that Clostridium botulinum type C or D was going to be the cause of equine grass sickness. He was quite happy that most of the botulinum neurotoxins, these are the toxins that cause classic botulism, were probably not the major cause because they, as Bruce said, are, are very much neurotoxic and not necessarily cytotoxic. They don't result in destruction of the cell. But in fact, there is some evidence that the botulinum neurotoxins C and D do in fact have some sort of cytotoxic effect. But certainly the ADP ribosylating toxin, the one we know as C2, which is produced by both type C and D, it's a very much a cytotoxic toxin and it could be responsible for the destruction of the neurons. So this could be a whole day's lecture in itself, talking about toxin genes in Clostridium botulinum, or maybe just Clostridium. They're encoded on the chromosomes sometimes, but more often than not, they're on mobile genetic elements, either plasmids or more commonly on bacteriophages. And these, these mobile genetic elements mean they can carry toxin genes from one bacterium to another and carry the toxin genes from it. And it's not just um, it's not just Clostridium botulinum they move between, it's be between related Clostridia, and there's even a lot of evidence now that they'll move between bacteria of completely different species to carry the toxin genes. So you get bacteria that are nothing like Clostridium botulinum, but are able to produce a whole gambit of toxin genes because they've acquired that, that genetic element. So that's just very confusing uh, and it's very, it, as a traditional microbiologist, it was, it was very confusing when we try to get pure cultures of these organisms because these toxin genes are on, often on things called pseudolysogenic bacteriophage. Now, those of you who know anything about bacterial genetics and know all about lysogeny and temperate phages, if you don't know anything about it, just forget about it. But these are, are very confusing and the genes are lost when these organisms are are trying to be purified by pure culture techniques. They spore, we often are growing from spores and spores don't carry these toxin genes. So I think that's already been said and it's a very complex interreaction. We should really be looking at the ecology of toxin genes rather than the organisms themselves. And whatever happens, I think we'll need a genomic approach this is your, your first omic and, and it's probably the most important omic, the genomic approach, and we'll mention this later. So this is some very old uh, results, I'm making you feel very old, Leonie. Um, this was one of the first things we did. We, we, we managed to get some antibodies to toxin, to botulinum toxin type C from Porton Down. We had some very sensitive antibody techniques that we we were able to adapt in an ELISA system and we were able to measure toxin in the, the gut, uh, well, the ileum and the feces of horses with acute grass sickness, with subacute grass sickness, with chronic grass sickness and compared them to controls. And you'll see that the ileum had the highest concentrations in the acute and the, in the subacute, uh, but they had significant amounts in the, the um, chronic grass sickness as well. So that was one of our first sort of crucial experiments showing that there was detectable toxin in the guts of these horses. We then moved on to serology. So they were not measuring antibodies themselves. Sorry, we're not measuring the, the toxins themselves, we're measuring antibodies that are produced in, the, in response to the toxins. So we demonstrated antibodies to Clostridium botulinum and its toxins in the blood, the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, we also looked at systemic responses and mucosal responses separately. So that's looking at immunoglobulin G and immunoglobulin A to see what was being produced. And this again is an old slide. I think I last used this. I've modified it ever so slightly, but it was last used in 2008. But we show here where we've looked at antibodies in cases and in, uh, in survivors. So these were, these were cases that were euthanized, so we were able to get uh, better specimens from them and also in survivors, but this was in blood. We 
as well as looking at antibodies for botulinum toxin type C and D, we also looked at surface antigens of the bacterium itself. And we looked at them in uh, the left of each of these pairs is in the euthanized uh, animals and the ones on the right in the survivors. And uh, this was antibodies to botulinum neurotoxin type C, significantly higher in the, uh, in the animals that survived. Type D was not so apparent, but in fact it was more similar. But the surface antigens were very different, many, many, much, much higher in the, uh, in the survivors than in the ones that had died. So the conclusion here was IgG antibodies in blood lower in euthanized animals than in survivors. We did a similar sort of thing, and this is with very, very smaller numbers, where we looked at mucosal antibodies. This is antibodies that are found in the gastrointestinal tract in both cases and controls. And we looked at samples from pharynx, stomach, duodenum, jejunum, ileum, cecum, colon, rectum, and feces. Now, I'm not sure what these different colors are. I think this is just something that didn't work when I transferred um, slides from 2008 in PowerPoint to the modern PowerPoint. But I think it's very, very obvious here. You see very, very much more antibody level, higher antibody levels, IgA antibody levels. These are produced in the gut to the toxins than we did in, in, the, in the controls. So the summary here was IgA antibodies in the gut are higher in cases than in controls. So we're looking at an immune response to the equine grass sickness agent. Uh, and this is something similar to what we've heard already. We're suggesting that natural exposure to low levels of clostridium botulinum type C or D and that both the toxins and contacts with the EGS, you get a protective immune response. Non-immune horses, oops, I see what you mean, Elspeth, this has uh, got a hair trigger. Um, Non-immune horses, we have lower immunoglobulin in the blood to the toxins and the surface antigens, and they're more at risk of developing equine grass sickness. No, it won't work at all. Uh, right, and so during chronic grass sickness, higher levels of IgA are produced in the gut. Right? So this is mucosal antibody, and there's an, but there's increasing levels of IgG and serum to botulinum toxins. So this is suggesting sort of sera conversion in during the course of the disease. Mucosal antibody is probably very important in protecting in the gut. Um, where you get higher levels in cases, and that's, that's indicating current or recent exposure. Already referred to this at the beginning, this is the study that uh, Helen, okay, Helen McCarthy, is that for my bit of a, oh dear, sorry about this. Um, right, so this is a study that Helen McCarthy did in Liverpool when Chris was there. She came to my lab to learn the techniques, but just look at the conclusions. This study provides strong support for the role of clostridium in the, in the etiology of EGS and identifies managemental risk factors of disease. And potential relevance, it's more or less saying that a vaccine is going to be a possibility. So a summary, convincing, but not with very much circumstantial evidence that equine grass sickness may be caused by botulinum type C or D, not necessarily the toxins, but a, the vaccine trial is a possibility. Now, this wasn't meant to take this long, but anyhow, we originally, this is, I think this is crucial to the whole debate and something that Chris was asking at the beginning. So the toxin, we wanted a, a vaccine. We initially thought it would be uh, would be developed by ourselves. It should include antitoxins. It should be sorry, toxoids to develop antitoxins to C and D, but also to C2 and also to C3, which I haven't had time to mention, but also to cell surface antigens. The I went off to Fort Dodge in Iowa to try to get them to make a vaccine. Subsequently, folks tried to get Neogen to prepare them, but we didn't have any success. And uh, we ended up 
with the vaccine that was used in the trial, which was pre prepared for mink and not for the, uh, not as we ideally hope, but it was probably the best bet. That makes it sound very simple. Is this where you take over the ink? Sorry about that. Thank you. I need to get some liquid as well because my <laughs> mouth is so dry. Thank you. So we thought it was really important to include the um, the results from the vaccine trial today, particularly to reflect on what they mean for the potential role of Clostridium botulinum type C in this disease. Now, you've already heard about the vaccine trial design this morning, so I'm going to move straight on to the results. Um, but before I do that, I just want to acknowledge that the, the results that I am presenting today uh, come from the, the lay report that Joe Island and the project team have written, and that's available on the, the Grass Sickness Fund website. And it's a, a really accessible read, so I recommend, recommend you look that up. So the, the main aim of the, the trial was to determine whether the vaccine was effective at preventing disease by comparing um, disease incidence rates between the vaccinated group and the placebo treated group of horses. Now, although there was a um, slightly lower disease incident rate in the vaccine group during the trial period compared to the placebo group. This wasn't a statistically significant difference. And the um, statistical analyses suggest that there was about a 30% chance that that was not a real difference. However, the disease incident rate in the, grass, in the placebo group uh, during the trial period was more than three times lower than had been anticipated and planned for in the trial design. So this means that the study was, the trial was underpowered, which, which means that the probability of being able to detect a statistically significant difference between the two groups was significantly reduced. And for the, for the incident rate that was experienced during the, the trial period, there would have needed to be a lot more horses in the trial to have been confident that you could have detected a significant difference. So while the vaccine efficacy results were, were disappointing, there were some really interesting findings uh, with respect to antibody levels to botulinum type C. So they showed that there was a greater risk of grass sickness associated with horses that had lower antibody levels to botulinum type C at the start of the trial, so before vaccination. And this is the first time that lower antibody levels um, before disease onset have been associated with the disease. And they also showed that there was a, a greater risk of grass sickness associated with a lower final antibody level to botulinum type C. And that was regardless of treatment group, so whether they've been in the vaccinated group or the, the placebo treated group. So just to recap then, the trial was unable to demonstrate a protective effect, but the trial was underpowered due to a lower incidence to the disease than, than was expected. Um, I think the trial really highlights the challenges in conducting a field trial for this disease, um, but it absolutely does not rule out the potential involvement of botulinum type C. And, and conversely, actually, um, the, the trial adds to, that's particularly antibody findings, add to and corroborate previous evidence that suggests a, a role for this organism and its toxins in the disease. And exactly what this role is does require further research and um, I was going to hand back to Ian to, to just reflect on, on that for the last slide. So don't worry, this is incredibly quick. Right, um, so um, I think we use conventional approaches. They were the only approaches we had at that time. We're talking about 20 years ago. So we need to think about um, modern techniques. And I think this has all, all been a mentioned already. So we require a metagenomic approach and that's already been done uh, with Chris's group and with Bruce's work on fungal toxins. So we need to do more of that. To develop a conventional vaccine using uh, components that are produced by a bacterium may be impossible. We'll almost certainly need recombinant technology. This is DNA technology to make vaccine candidates. So or maybe a single candidate. We we know everybody knows lots about vaccines now because of the COVID vaccine. We may be able to use nucleic acid based approaches, but I think more than anything, and this has come up more than once already this morning, we need a test system. It would be great if we had an animal model. I suppose we do, and we have a horse model, but that would be impossible to to do. 
We tried several years ago to, to use a rabbit model because there was a rabbit, uh, the disease is present in rabbits, but we weren't, it. We, we, I think ethically, even that's impossible now because of uh, home office regulations. So an animal model's out. An organ or an organoid model or even a cell line is a possibility. And I think this is very much one of the focuses of the research fellowship along with the biobank sample. So the research fellowship would be very much developing some sort of model to test these, these uh, potential vaccines in. So that's it. I think I want to finish just by acknowledging lots and lots of people. Keith Miller and Jean Robb, they were instrumental in getting me into this, this in intriguing subject. It may not be obvious, but I know absolutely nothing about horses, not, nothing at all other than that they're, they're big and they're, they're frightening. Um, we got funding from all sorts of places, Horse Race Betting Levy Board. We're going to hear more about Dubai Millennium later. Lots of PhD students and technicians. Uh, there's the, the group from here, um, Bruce, Scott, Elspeth, Rod Els, who was a frightening pathologist who we managed to get samples from. And, uh, and finally, we've already seen this, uh, the project team, Joe Ireland, who I haven't seen yet, but no doubt will later on, and Richard and, and co, uh, who, who did the project. And that's it, thanks. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ian, Ian and Leo. <laughs> you guess what I'm about to say? There's no time for questions. Um, but um, thank you so much, actually, both of you for, for giving a really good, interesting talk. And the, please catch um, Ian, Leonie, um, any of the others involved in the vaccine trial um, at, at lunchtime. I'm sure they'd be happy to answer questions. So we're going to move swiftly on. And um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Richard Newton. Um, Richard works as a veterinary surgeon in mixed practice before joining the Animal Health Trust and he has a breadth of experience in epidemiology, surveillance and control of, of a range of different equine diseases, including influenza, strangles and herpes virus. He was Director of Epidemiology and Disease Surveillance and Acting Director of Research. Um, when the Animal Health Trust closed, um, Richard established the Equine Infectious Disease Surveillance as a new initiative providing global disease surveillance and advice on disease prevention strategies. Um, thank you very much, Richard. This is the final talk in the science session. This morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lee. Um, I'm not going to give you an over overview slide because I'm planning to stick to the title. Um, past, present and future often is, is useful in focusing your mind. So what do we mean by disease surveillance? Well, I looked for this and found this uh, glossary um, and that quotes something that comes from the CDC in the USA. And essentially surveillance is the ongoing systematic collection, analysis and interpretation of data with the timely dissemination to those responsible for preventing and controlling disease. So it sounds pretty straightforward. And I think it is, uh, it, it is important. But what I took from this article actually was that here they call it public health surveillance. So that's the data, the information leading to decisions and actions being taken. But you could take a slightly different route and accept that that generates knowledge. And we accept that that actually is research. So disease research and disease surveillance are very closely aligned. And that's a theme I want to sort of bring out as I go through. Um, we mentioned Helen McCarthy, Chris, uh, Nigel French. As part of uh, Helen's PhD, she, um, she researched this and wrote a very nice uh, literature review. And I'm going to quote that because I think that takes care of a lot of the past surveillance, certainly the historical surveillance that we might think of. We've heard about the earliest cases being recognised, certainly in the early 1900s, and the poor old uh, um, uh, army remount camp at Barry in, in, in Angus seemed to be the focus of where that was. But in that article, we can see that uh, Tocker, whose name we've heard a lot today, what he also did was to plot the occurrence of the disease and the way that it um, uh, seemingly possibly transmitted uh, across uh, Scotland, both north and, and west. Um, and also we get an idea of what impact this disease was having. Up in Moray, 14% uh, uh, mortality was, uh, was, was, was reported. In this uh, review, we also get a um, description of how the disease was first recognised in a number of different reports over a number of years by Guthrie in 1940. So we can start to see this disease appearing in northern England, in other parts of uh, England, and also in, in, in Wales as well. 
Um, so these were largely limited case reports. And I, the impression I got was that there were far fewer cases of the disease in, uh, than was seen in the early days in Scotland, but it was certainly appearing uh, south of the border as well. So thinking about that question of surveillance and research being hand in hand, um, those early studies and recognition of the disease facilitated investigation of those potential etiologies which we're hearing about today and some of them we are revisiting possibly for a third time. But this was impacting on agriculture, this, these were agricultural animals, and it was pleasing then to see that industry was putting money behind this uh, and, and funding, funding the research. Surveys and experiments were being conducted and we've heard about those investigation of plants, insects, fungi, the bacteria and their relevant toxins. And most notably, we had the toxico-infectious uh, botulism theory, botulinum theory, um, and this was pursued by Docker. I, I won't concentrate on, on this, but just to pick up on what Chris said about welcome, uh, I did find it, manage to find this, this um, image here in the bottom right, which has welcome's name uh, for a product for the treatment of grass sickness and obviously prophylaxis as well. But what was impressive here was the uh, two years of a vaccine trial that was conducted. Uh, this involved over 2,000 horses, possibly some, uh, that, that's an overinflation because we don't know which horses were in, in, in each year. But I think it was a well-conducted trial and they relied on death from grass sickness as their outcome. Mentioning Jo, she wrote a, an interesting article in the build-up to the vaccine trial that we conducted, and this appeared in the Bentley record, and the details of what Tocca presented are indeed in this article, and I'll just highlight them here. These are the data that um, actually at the time um, were incredibly impressive. We got uh, what looked to be very marked and a biological gradient of protection from inoculation against this disease. That was repeated in 1923 when the results were even more impressive. And in fact, the animals that were known to have two doses of this, uh, they saw no disease. So this was, as, as Ian said, incredibly powerful uh, and statistically significant results. But as happens with veterinary science, uh, it came under intense criticism. And by 1927, when there was an article in The Lancet, uh, this was largely um, uh, 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 forgotten as, as, as a theory, which was a, a, a real shame, given that there may have been a commercial backer for a vaccine at the time. So these early reports uh, involved the collation and number of, of and distribution of grass sickness cases. And I think we have to think that those were probably largely periodic, somewhat retrospective, but that really reflected the technology of the day. And that's where I think looking to the future and what we've managed to do since is we should be taking um, uh, taking that technology and using that to our, our advantage. A number of epidemiological risk factor studies, which is obviously where Helen's um, work was going. So she outlined the various different studies, mainly conducted in Scotland, various different data collection methods used and different analyses as well, not always uh, statistical. Uh, Ian has touched on this, actually a seminal uh, study which uh, Helen McCarthy and Chris and a whole host of people got involved in and that paved the way to re-exploring the, the work that had been done in the recent years to, to, to looking at uh, Clostridium botulinum. Um, we had a meeting in Newmarket in 2003, brought together a lot of the players to think about how we might do this. This was written in a meeting report that was published in the Equine Veterinary Journal. And I'll just highlight the year that that, that report came out. 2004, that's a full 10 years before any horse on that trial got a vaccine. So the long lead in time is, is there and a lot of effort by a lot of people went into that and most notably Jo Ireland who deserves all the plaudits that she gets. So as part of that we recognised that actually we did need to know what was going on with this disease and it would be an important feature to know about surveillance in the build up to a vaccine trial. And so through the generous funding of the Horse Trust um, we uh, put together a proposal for the Equine Grass Sickness Surveillance Scheme that was created in 2008, based at the Animal Health Trust. This is when Claire Wiley came and, and set that up with us. And we used uh, a number of different approaches there. It was predicated on uh, a database of affected premises that had the Grass Sickness Fund at the heart, the University of Edinburgh, but we also tapped into other resources that were there. We created a website uh, a dedicated couple of um, uh, questionnaires, gathering premises information, history of disease, etc., and also the individual cases. And that allowed us to generate both case data and some numerator data on the population on those affected premises. 
And that data analysis early on went into the uh, proposals that, that went for funding to, to support the graph sickness, um, uh, the, 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 the Clostridium uh, vaccine. Uh, this paper was written by, uh, first author by Claire, uh, so it summarises the development of that scheme and, and, and gathers together a decade of data going back to uh, the beginning uh, of, of the millennium. That, as Bruce said, uh, logged um, 1,400 cases within that 10 year period. The predominant numbers were in, uh, were in England, but in terms of um, um, at risk population, almost certainly higher in Scotland. And, and this paper does highlight that. Uh, the paper and these data just confirmed a lot of what we already knew. Cases can occur any time, but the peak is often in May, irrespective of country. We have this somewhat intriguing sinusoidal annual pattern of disease, which we do see in other uh, actually infectious disease when you look at longer patterns of disease, although there could have well have been a reporting bias behind this. In terms of the age distribution, yes, predominantly younger animals, but we did see this intriguing long tail uh, into the distribution. So not just young animals that are at risk from this, this disease. We've heard a lot about this uh, and, and, and um, Chris and um, Ian put that slide up there. Consortium approach requiring the funding. This did in, uh, you know, this, this involved many hundreds, thousands of, of pounds of funding and it would not have been possible for one single funder. But the point of this slide is actually to acknowledge that the surveillance scheme that we created went into a lot of parts of developing that program. It didn't just happen overnight. There were animal test certificates that had to be applied for, data went into that. Ethical approvals, data went into that. Sample size calculations, absolutely fundamental. We knew what was going on in the country in the build up to this trial. And then obviously the build up, the pilot study, feasibility study that Joe, Joe ran, in fact, two of them and then the full RCT itself. So the pilot study, thanks to veterinary practices up in the uh, up on the east side of Scotland, 10 eligible premises, 110 horses, there were losses there, and mimicking what we might expect when we take this full trial out, uh, out into the field. And that was a very helpful uh, precursor to, to running the study. And thankfully what it did was it also demonstrated what we we're putting into these horses did seem to be creating an immunological, um, uh, a measurable immunological uh, response, although we didn't know obviously whether that was going to protect. Feasibility study, again, the grass sickness surveillance scheme helped us identify the populations where we wanted to go and take and ask the questions, uh, 200 vets, for example. And what that did was gave us the encouragement that what we were doing was going to be perceived as important on these premises amongst the veterinary profession and, and amongst the horse industry as well. So coming to this trial, it's sacrilege that I've boiled this down to one slide and we've already heard it, but this is, is what it was. The trial itself repeated what we'd seen in the pilot, but this is the killer. We had over a thousand horses over the period recruited, but we only had nine eligible cases. There were 16 cases recorded on these same premises, but in horses that weren't on the trial. That may have made a difference if they had been recruited. Referring this to Tocker, for the same sort of horse he is at risk, he had over 100 cases. We had less than 10. So that was that. And unfortunately, the conclusion is that we failed to demonstrate a significant effect in, in that trial. But that was, you know, we didn't have the expected rate of disease. But as Ian said, and, and Leone, uh, this trial did corroborate some of those earlier findings that we've seen. So with the end of the funding that we had, Jo, probably with hindsight, made this sensible decision. She returned to uh, Liverpool where she'd done her PhD, done great work since then, uh, and surveillance and, and research into, um, in, into EGS um, ceased at the Animal Health Trust, and uh, some years later, the HD ceased. But I'm very pleased to say that the hosting of the surveillance questionnaire reverted back to the Grass Sickness Fund have been great supporters of everything that we've done and it's still there today and you can still fill in a report case and gather that information. We put those information in our in our quarterly uh, reports and, and, and it's a great contribution I think to that to that report. But looking to the future we've done no review of epidemiological data or surveillance data since that paper from uh, Claire Wiley and I'm very keen that we do at least look at that again and I am planning and we have a project lined up for a Cambridge uh, veterinary student where we're now based 
uh, they've had access to data kindly supplied by the fund and we will be uh, looking at that in, in, in the coming few months. Um, I think we need to improve uh, reporting of, of this disease, but it is a major challenge. There is a stigma associated with this and I think there may well be an inertia in some of these repeatedly uh, affected premises and I think we need to work hard in trying to overcome that and I'm not underestimating that because I think it is a challenge. I think one way we can try and do this is to tap into something called syndromic surveillance. Anonymized equine practice electronic health records are being used increasingly, particularly in small animals, and I think that paves a way that we can start to do this. And I'll just mention a couple. Uh, one is EVSNET, the Equine Veterinary Surveillance Network, funded by the Horse Trust in terms of its development, uh, and uh, it's very much modelled on the successful SAVSNET model. And if you want to read more about this, we published an article in our uh, surveillance uh, as a surveillance focus back in 2021. There's a similar program, slightly different, based at the RVC, known as Equine Vet Compass. Vet Compass being the Veterinary Companion Animal Surveillance System. And again, that's a way that I think we can tap into uh, records without asking vets to complete uh, questionnaires and that sort of thing. Um, I think we need to make reporting of the disease more real time, and I think this could be an exciting development in, 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 in the coming year or so. Um, using searchable online platforms where we collate the information and I think thinking about issuing anonymized alerts. Um, we have created a number of platforms uh, under our, our new incarnation and I'll just touch on these but on the right there you'll see the telltale text alert. We have a system for notifying vets when certain diseases occur in this country and we are used to collating information from all around the world and, and, and presenting it. So this is an example of an email that will be sent out alerting subscribers that receive this about diseases. You'll see the second one of those is, is a West Nile neurological case that occurred in the UK back in November of, of last year. You click on that link there, it goes to a report and then you can get more details about that case, where it is occurring uh, in, the, in the country and we always report to the county level. We also run something called the Telltale Text Alert Scheme so the same example, this would land onto uh, the uh, mobile device of a subscriber. So that's often vets in practice, but it can be professional horse keepers as well. You click on that link embedded there, and that takes you to the same information from the same database uh, about the West Nile case that we saw in Hertfordshire. Um, and I think having that sort of information landing in a timely manner onto devices uh, of people interested in these diseases, I think a logical extension of that is, can we investigate the development of risk warnings about the development of, of, of the threat from, from this disease? And then this is something that Joe started to look at in a, in a project uh, that was, um, I think, with a, a master's student at Liverpool, gave some encouraging early disease, but we've never revisited it. So this would be based on me meteorological factors and probably linked to the history of grass sickness uh, in an area. And I think for this to work, it's gonna to have to be very local rather than national, but I think it is something that we ought to be looking at. And I've picked this example here, not grass sickness, it's SCOP, so it's the Sustainable Control of Parasites of Sheep. They run something called the Nematodirus Forecast. This is based on weather conditions uh, linked to the different 140 weather stations dotted around the UK. And if you dig into these data, you see that actually they monitor those conditions uh, and they will send out alerts to registering uh, sheep farmers that they can make decisions based on their own uh, factors that they have locally. And uh, it just raises awareness and what the threat of, of, of disease is. So just to wrap up, um, I think disease surveillance and research uh, are in inextricably linked and hopefully we can keep working together on that. And both of these are necessary if we are going to advance disease control and prevention. Um, but the challenges, I think, remain with disease reporting by owners and vets, and I think a lot of effort, we do need to make a, double our efforts in terms of, of getting that going. And I'm very grateful to the Grass Sickness Fund because they've been a, a real continuum uh, in, in, in this. And then finally, I think the hope is that modern digital technologies can certainly facilitate the timely collation and then reporting of disease-related information. And I think that's something that um, can and should be starting to be applied to um, the surveillance of equine grass sickness um, as we move move forward from here. So thank you very much.
thank you very much, Richard, and for sticking brilliantly to time. Um, and I think the, the emphasis on epidemiology and surveillance is hugely important um, and the development of some of these new technologies. And I think we might hear a bit about that in the next science session. Um, and if anyone has any questions for Richard, please do catch him at lunchtime. I'm, I'm going to move on now, just in, in awareness of time, because we're running slightly late. Um, but I'm um, really happy to introduce this next uh, session where we're going to take a, a little break from the science and actually acknowledge our wonderful um, fundraisers today. And there's two people I'd like to introduce to, to help with this next section. Um, Sally McCarthy, um, who's been chair of the British Horse Society since September 2022. Um, Sally has served as vice chair on many of the local committees and she's got a fantastic track record in business and fundraising. Um, she's raised over two million pounds to build an equestrian centre in Aberdeenshire, which is used for a lot of educational equine events. Um, and the second person I'd like to introduce you to is Rose McPherson who is a great friend of the late Robert Davidson, who is the inspiration behind the trophy, the Tryon Trophy, that will be presented just now. Um, and Rose piloted several of Robert Tryon's ponies to competitive success. And we're delighted to welcome Rose here today to, prevent the, to present the Tryon Trophy in Robert's memory. Um, I'd first like to invite Sally up to say a few words. Hi everyone, so firstly thank you to um, everyone for inviting me along to speak today and to present these awards. I was having a look at them a couple of nights ago and reading the bios for all the awards today and the people that are involved are absolutely inspiring when we go through them, what they've achieved, um, what they've contributed to the Grass Sickness Fund and things over the years. Um, so I'm obviously honoured to be the chair of the British Horse Society at the moment. I do a three year term and that's my volunteer role. So it's what I do in my spare time. Um, my day job is running quite a big equestrian centre up in Aberdeen, which is one of the hot spots, unfortunately, for grass sickness cases in the city and the Shire and things. So I'm also one of those owners that every morning has a panic when I look in the field and one of our herds is lying down in a strange place. Um, and it's not just the horse costs of this kind of devastating disease, it's the human cost as well. So I'm dealing with liveries. We've lost one over the years to acute grass sickness and dealing with the livery in that situation is horrendous. So I think I would just completely emphasise what everybody said so far about working collaboratively. I, I'm not a clever scientist, I don't have graphs and things, but I do run a big yard and I know that the majority of our owners would be so pleased to hear the talk about collaboration today and how much can be brought to the table by all the different groups and organisations. So for my volunteering role with the BHS, it's one of the reasons that I want to volunteer with the BHS and have done a lot with them over the years is just how much they give back to every horse and, and to every owner. Um, they're an amazing charity that I've done a lot with over the years. Um, and one of the things that the BHS has been heavily involved with more recently is funding £60,000 towards the biobank. So this started in 2021 um, and it started at our board of trustees. It comes to us um, as designated funding to approve and there's been massive support from it, from our board of trustees through the staff team and in particular to Helena and the BHS Scotland team who are such huge supporters again of working collaboratively and again the BHS is in, in working with um, lots of different big organisations and smaller organisations to try and do something about such a devastating disease. So I'm not going to talk much further to, to keep to time properly. Um, so I'm going to move on now and present the, the first trophy of today, um, which is the Trowan Trophy. Um, now, whilst I may be Scottish, I am a complete townser. I live in the middle of the city, so I'm going to apologise in advance for mispronunciation of some of the Scottish names. I'm very um, geographically challenged when it comes to different places. Um, so just bear with me for some of the later awards where um, I was reading through them earlier and asking my friends how to pronounce things and stuff. Um, so the first one is the Trowan Trophy, as we said. Um, so in August 2022, Scotland's equestrian community lost one of its greatest characters in Robert Davidson of Cars of Trowan Farm. Robert was a great friend to the Equine Grass Sickness Fund. In following the survival of his precious Highland Pony stallion, Ruri of Mendic, after a protracted battle with grass sickness at the Royal Dick Vet. 
One of Robert's most famous antics was his annual haircut at the Royal Highland Show, where Robert would get his fulsome walrus moustache shaved off to raise funds for grass sickness research. Robert's zest for life is now remembered through the Trowan Trophy and it's awarded to the most fun loving supporter of the year. So for the first ever recipient of this trophy, we can't think of anyone that would be more suited than Carrie Bain of Hare Law Equestrian in Long Nidri. Carrie started raising money for Equine Grass Sickness Fund after the loss of seven ponies in 2014, when the Hare Law onesie ride was born. So if you're ever near Long Nidri, don't be surprised if you are suddenly overtaken by a herd of horses and their young riders dressed in colourful onesies. Having started as an annual event, Carrie now hosts several throughout the year from Easter through to Christmas. What totally stands out about everything is the smile on everyone's faces as the days go on. So the young riders, their mums, dads, grannies, granddads, everyone has a smile on their face. The stables are decked out in banners with games to play and the staff in, have craft stalls to entertain everyone. Every rider receives a rosette and learns a bit more about this devastating disease. Amongst all the festival atmosphere is Carrie, always with the biggest smile of all, whatever the weather, dressed in an outlandish outfit and sometimes keeping track of about 140 children on endless ponies having a day out to remember. Over the years, Carrie with her mum and dad, Murray and Brenda, and all of Team Chiblet, as they are known at the yard, have raised over £36,000, which is an incredible achievement. The Hare Law Equestrian onesie ride is a team effort, and we are delighted to have some of them here with us today. Debbie Cavers, Judy Cornwall, Shan Grant, Shona Mullen, Elise Perry, Leah Stewart and Kat Wilkie are all here in the audience. Plus, we know there are many others following at home. Carrie, we can't thank you enough for all your fundraising efforts and for your fun-loving attitude. Please come up to receive your Trowan Trophy and a silver salver on behalf of all your team. Thank you, thank you very much uh, for that, uh, for the presentation. And I'd also like to give my huge congratulations to Carrie and her team. And I had the pleasure of, of going with them last last year to one of the events. And it's absolutely phenomenal. So thank you. Um, so for our final session before lunch, um, I'm just going to hand over the chair to Elspeth Milne for um, our final presentations. Thank you, Elspeth. Thanks very much, Lee. So uh, I think we've, we've lost about ten minutes, but we'll try and we'll try and keep to time now. So for this, the second session, um, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. David Smith, who is a More Done Fellow, and he's recently established his first research group at the More Done Research Institute. His research interests include developing new cutting-edge molecular and cer cellular tools to improve um, life sciences research. He's particularly interested in applying these to investigate how pathogens interact with their hosts um, and with a long term view towards translating this research into novel disease in interventions. So David. Hello everyone. Um, Thank you, first of all, for the invitation to present. Um, we're going to take a little bit of a different track from the talks that you've seen so far today. I'm going to present a more of a conceptual talk um, when it comes to EGS and host um, biology in general, uh, but it'll be informed by some of the research that we've been doing um, in other animal species. 
Um, I'm not a particularly clever scientist, but I do have one graph. So um, I think that, that's obligatory at this stage, given all the talks that we've had so far. Um, yeah, so taking a different track, but hopefully as we go through, you can you can appreciate how some of the technology can be applied to EGS, and I'll focus on that a bit more towards the end. <clears throat> so the technologies I'm going to focus on in particular are the um, development of particular lab-based platforms um, that um, don't necessarily replace the animal itself, but allow us to study precise aspects of the animal's biology within the lab. <clears throat> and so if we think of it on a spectrum, and neither side of this is better or worse, it depends on what you're looking at, some advantages and disadvantages of this, this end of the spectrum, and there are advantages and disadvantages of this end of the spectrum. <clears throat> For, if actually, if we do quickly focus on EGS and horses, we don't really have much at this end of the spectrum to focus on at all. And that's also the case for a lot of the livestock species that we work on at the modern as well. A lot of the research is focused up here at this end of the spectrum, and that comes with a lot of noise. There's a lot more going on in these samples. There's a lot more uh, complexity and variation within them. Um, that makes it more difficult to interpret the data. And I think from the talks that we've seen presented so far today, there's a lot of valuable data in there, but it's really hard. And a decade's worth of research has, has shown that it's really hard to pick out what is the cause of EGS um, and, and, and all sorts of aspects around that. Um, and so for the same reasons we're trying to do for some of our other livestock species and the diseases that we're interested in, we're developing some of these um, more simple um, cell-based systems in the lab, but they do come with certain degrees of complexity compared to tradi more traditional, um, more established cell culture systems that have been around for a bit longer. <laughs> what makes us particularly well adapted for this type of research at the modern is that we have our own on-site animal facilities. That allows us, to, which is, if this is a research institute, institute, it's based just up here at the back, and that allows us to get tissues from animal into the lab within minutes or hours. Um, and that means that we're getting high quality material um, from the animals that we can then have high success rates at growing cell culture models in the lab. <clears throat> we can also do this quite ethically um, um, because for all of the organoid, or I, I still couldn't say it's an organoid talk, but for all of the cell culture systems we've developed so far, we've never um, housed animals specifically for the purpose of making organoids. We've always taken our material from other trials, from control animals, um, and so we're really able to, I think, in, a, in an ethical way, develop these systems. And we're also able to focus on the target animal species so that the disease affects. And so compared to this technology development in mice or humans, in mice it's a non-target species and there's a lot of differences in mice compared to animals or humans, depending on the disease or the, the health status you're trying to study. And with humans, a lot of this technology has been developed from biopsies, which, which often come from um, non-healthy sample types, things like tumours we can take from control animals in our target species and that allows us to, to establish what I would consider gold standard or grade A cell culture systems. <clears throat> the ones that I'm going to focus on now are um, the culture systems we've been developing from the intestinal tract. Um, there's a few reasons for that, That's because a lot of the parasites or pathogens that we're interested in our livestock species, they're enteric, they affect that part of the body. And it's a very difficult part of the body to, to visualize and see. And so by having a system that we can grow in the lab and we can manipulate and, and do more high throughput experiments in, is something we've been uh, striving to, to, to get our hands on. Um, and so the talk will focus on this, but organoids aren't limited to these types of tissues. And we'll kind of touch on that towards the end. Uh, but if we think of the gut, this is what we're trying to establish in the lab. So this is the lumen of the gut. This is where everything passes through. And this is the site that our pathogens or our toxins are initially going to be interacting with. So this is one of, one of the types of tissues that we're really interested to develop in the lab. And if we zoom in on that, um, within this, we've got the, the stubs are the, are, the, are the villus on the epithelial lining. And you can see these little pore-like um, structures within, within that tissue. And that's the crypt um, of, uh, in, in the stomach. That will be a gland. In the intestine, we call it a crypt. For all intents and purposes, it's a little pore that contains at the bottom of it stem cells. And these stem cells come pre-programmed for the tissue from which they're derived. And so if we take these from the intestine or we take these or from the ileum, the duodenum, the jejunum, different parts of the intestine, if we take it from the, the, the stomach, we're able to grow organize that, recapitulate aspects of that specific tissue's biology um, and, 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 and an element of its complexity. Um, don't know if I can get these. Can I get these today? Yes. And so we take actually, so what we collect from the tissue in the lab is we're collecting this bit that contains the stem cells. And so this here is the base of that crypt that you can see here. So this is lots of different cells in here, um, including the stem cells. 
Um, within just a few hours, you can see when we grow it in the lab under certain conditions, we get a three dimensional structure that starts to form. It forms a, a, a sealed ball and on the inside of that is the lumen. And so what we're sort of on a very miniature scale, we can picture in here is that hole in the middle with the epithelial cells around the outside. And then this on the on the right is um, <clears throat> when we're growing them in a dish, we don't just have one, we have lots of them in the well. So each one is like a mini intestinal tract. This is um, this was done by my colleague, uh, Dr. Ambre Shapri, who's in the audience today. <clears throat> I mentioned we've been doing this for livestock species and what we've been developing are these things called organoids. So we had a, a mention of the word in a couple of the earlier talks. What is an organoid? Um, I guess for the uninitiated, these are stem cell derived, as I just mentioned. So they come with a blueprint from primary stem cells that we grow them from. Um, <clears throat> they form multicellular structures that self-organize. So as you saw before, it self-organizes. And within that we have, not only are they multicellular, but they contain different cell types. And that's the key that makes them better than some of the other, or I say better, I shouldn't say better, but uh, a more complex system than those, some of those single cell systems we've worked on before. They've got um, lots of uh, specialized cell types within them that we haven't been able to have in previous cell, cell culture systems, um, which is kind of um, shown in this schematic here. And just to kind of, again, kind of, it's more about showing some pretty pictures, but uh, something else that my colleague on we, on we developed from a bovine helium. Um, you can, I think this is a really nice example of showing at the microscopic level what we are capturing. If you think of that, that guts, uh, 3D gut image you saw before, what you've got here is, is that all over again, um, just at the micro level. And so we'll just quickly play that again. So as we're kind of coming down, this is a 3D projection of this section of an organoid. And you can see within it, we've got this clear lumen with these epithelial cells around the outside. So this is the, the stump, this is the, the, the lumen of the gut that we're, we're wanting to get access to and recapitulate in the lab. <clears throat> and I think now kind of thinking about this towards EGS, some of the data here, to try and think about how this might fit in or with horse, horse health and disease in general. Um, one of my colleagues, Mark Faber, developed um, organized from, ran a project to develop organized from the gastric uh, abomasum of, 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 of cattle. And one thing I want you to pay attention to here, so if these are our tissue, so uh, back up a little bit, each data point on this graph, this is why I'm only allowed to present one graph because it takes, I'm not, I'm not uh, describing it properly, um, but each data point on this graph represents the overall transcriptome of these animals. That transcriptome is every gene being expressed at different levels within that animal. And so here we have the transcriptome collected from tissue samples of three independent cows, and then these are from the organoids derived from those animals across different passages. So what he was looking for to show here was that we have certain genes being expressed, key genes being expressed within the organoids that are associated with the tissue they were derived, and that they continually were expressed and consistent over time, hence lots of data points clustering together. But the thing to pay attention to is that we can effectively draw a straight line across from these data points from the individual animals, which are color coded based on the animal from which they're derived. <clears throat> and I think in the context of EGS, that could be really valuable and it fits with some of the parasite work we've been doing in these animals, where if we take the stem cells from the EGS horse and compare that to the healthy horse, we should, I think, be able to develop organoids that are representative of EGS at an epithelial cell level, um, and therefore use that as a model for EGS within the lab. And so if there's a difference in the status of the epithelial cells within an EGS horse, we'd be able to recapitulate that and experimentally use that in the lab with different neurotoxins and then test them in healthy organisms from healthy horses and see if there's any differences that the EGS horses come primed with. And just kind of holding on that you can, uh, uh, some nice evidence, just picking out a couple of genes. You don't have to care about what the genes are. All you need to see is that the, the colours are consistent between the tissue and then in the organoids they produce. So if it's a gene that's highly expressed in one animal, it's highly expressed in the organoids that are derived from it. If it's lowly expressed here in blue in another animal, it's lowly expressed in the organoids derived from it. And that's something I think we could carry forward that could be quite powerful in AGS. Another example is where we've been doing this from infected sheep, sheep that are infected with um, uh, gastric or intestinal nematodes. And when we try and culture organoids from the stem cells derived from the, um, the, the infected sheep, you see here there's um, much fewer green dots than there are in that one. That's very obvious and we can quantify that across loads and loads of organoids uh, with our master student Will Anderson and our postdoc Dr. Kate Hildersley who helped with this research. Will's been driving it and he showed that there's been a big reduction in the number of tough cells that are able to form an organoids derived from the, the, um, the infected um, sheep and what, why that's kind of relevant is that that's showing that if we take the stem cells from an animal of a certain disease state, 
and grow it to organize in the lab. This is without the worms being present in the lab. It still carries forward the effects of the infection or the status of the animal. So we can effectively be growing an infected sheep model here without even having the parasite present. And that's why I'm kind of thinking we might be able to do something for EGS, even without knowing what the pathogen is to begin with. <clears throat> and so that, that's kind of that key point on this slide. So we don't have to go, uh, go on this, spend too long on this one. So that's the idea is if we could, uh, I think a step one for this technology would be to um, tap into things like the biobank and these networks of people that are able to get access to horse tissue. Uh, this has been a lot more easier to do in the animals that we've been focusing on before because we can do controlled trials up at our, up at our site and get access to control animals very easy. The harder thing here with, with the, the horse species is it's getting access to good quality material um, and getting it in the lab quick enough. And also it's better to collect these from younger animals because they have a lot more healthy stem cells in the gut. Sorry for every older person in the audience, but as you get older, your stem cells are not as good as they were when you were young. And so if we take from an older animal, they might not um, form organized quite as efficiently or effectively as if we take them from a, a younger animal. Um, and so uh, th there can be caveats with the collection, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try, right? And so I think if we take from a, uh, if we're able to access samples from healthy horses, as long as we have all of the background of those individual animals, like we get through the biobank, the sex, the, the uh, everything about that animal, the age and everything, and it's how states we'd be able to have a well curated line of organoids and then to hopefully do that from EGS horses um, and have separate separate lines for experimental comparison within the lab. <clears throat> There's also been um, mentioned in the previous talks that uh, EGS um, having a, a microbial cause, causal agent or at least something that a microbial contributor to, to the, 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 the onset and development of EGS. And so another option is to experimentally test this in the lab with these models. Um, so we can we can grow these as 3D, but we can actually actually and the bit that we want access to is the center of it, but we can get it to open up and lie flat as well with all of that architecture still present in terms of the cell types and everything within there. And if we've got it lying open flat, we could put our pathogens on the surface or our neurotoxins on the surface and look at the effect on those cell types and how they respond um, um, to, to the potential cause of agents. And why that's quite nice compared to the animals is we're losing a lot of the noise then. We're doing it in a more simpler system. And we can also do this in lots of wells in a dish and do something a bit more higher throughput as well. And we can plug bits in and out of the system. It's kind of like playing with Lego. We can add bits in and remove bits that increase and decrease that complexity as we see fit. And then kind of building on that, and there's also been mentioned that there's a potential genetic component of EGS. And that's something else we can do in these systems. So we can derive organoids from a healthy horse and we could, if there was a gene target to go after that, it was potentially something that was associated with EGS, we could genetically modify those lines. And that's a tech technology that I, was, uh, I became familiar with actually in the parasite toxoplasm gondii, but it's something that the same tools could be applied to these, these host cells. Um, <clears throat> and then to try and see if we can establish EGS-like organoids based on the genetic modifications, try and prove certain genetic components that may or may not um, be a, a, a causal factor. And um, I guess the reverse would be true if we took from an equine grass sickness horse, could, and we, we, we knew we were growing something like an equine grass sickness organoid, can we reverse that with genetic modification to a healthy state as well? <clears throat> and so kind of just back, um, backing up to the slide from the start, hopefully you can appreciate where these fit in um, and, and how they could potentially be used for EGS. <clears throat> and I mentioned that it doesn't just stop with um, the intestine, and this is probably something important to consider. We saw things like the, the, the role of the, the nervous system in EGS and everything. That is something we could potentially build into these systems in a core culture system. It would not be trivial, but the idea of having an intestinal epithelial layer sitting on top of a neuronal layer, I think would be the perfect EGS system we could have in the lab for, for testing the effects and looking at the effect, not just on the epithelium, but on the actual neurons themselves and any signaling that's taking place. Um, but We've been getting a lot of expertise in modern for doing this. So now we've got multiple projects going from different tissue types for um, from different animal species. Uh, and I'm keen to I, I've got a vision for trying to have modern be an international center of excellence or expertise for animal organoid systems. Um, and I, I think we're on a good track for developing that and for, for, for driving this technology. We've taken very much a technology driven approach to this that I think is then very well positioned to apply to any potential context, whether it's horse EGS or sheep with its uh, intestinal nematodes, um, that we can we can plug and play into anything. Um, and so, yeah, we're in the process of developing this, but this is somewhere where EGS and, and, and horses can fit in. I showed on one of the previous slides that <clears throat> we have, and that was something that Ombre and, and Kathy were, were uh, kind of led really, was we've been able to grow um, and, and establish intestinal horse organoids in our lab, um, and we're keen to 
open that out into and as well as liver organoids, but we're keen to open that out into other tissue types. I think where that's important is that you all know it's hard to get funding for EGS, but these organoid systems, because of their the way they can be plugged into different different areas, could be used as a platform for bringing in money for other research questions, other diseases, but then leveraging that to develop platforms that could be used for EGS as well. So we don't necessarily need the money for EGS to develop these systems. We can get it for another purpose, but then also use it for EGS down the line. So just trying to think strategically is how, how we could harness money to develop these systems further. And that's me. Hopefully that's provided you with a nice background into what the, how the organized technology works, how it might fit into EGS. Um, and just to quickly acknowledge, a lot of my colleagues within the organoid group that have helped drive a lot of the organoid research we've got going on here, a lot of the funding so far that has helped drive that as well. Thank you very much. Well, thanks very much, David. That was, a, I think it was a fascinating example of some of the new techniques that can be potentially used for, um, for grass sickness research. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Yes. Yeah, that's probably the best question. Um, I think that was some of the hesitancy to being with when we were thinking about collecting these. Um, I mentioned that we have a kind of gold standard system for getting things very quickly. Um, that's better. Um, obviously, um, stem cells, well, they'll start to die over time, but it's not like they're all dead within two hours. So it's just, it's a gradual scale of cell death. So the sooner we can get it into the lab, the better. Um, the better chance that this, we've got viable stem cells in the sample that would form the organoids. And that's all we need. And if we can even get just a few organoids to form, we can propagate from them and make more and more. So I would estimate if we can get them into the lab within less than six hours, that would be ideal. But that doesn't mean to say if we can collect something say 12 after hours at post-mortem it might still possess enough stem cells if we take a, a big enough piece of material to get that we can get from then we might still have enough in there that that would form organized so it's, it's more like just a gradual scale it's not like there's a time point where it no longer works i would say probably don't go beyond 12 to 24 hours and um, the key thing is get it into take it's a very simple procedure that's something i kind of didn't go through just cut out the tissue we put it into a, a solution called HBSS, which is just a, a, salt, a buffered salt solution with a carbon source in there. So it's a very simple uh, liquid formula. Um, and then with some antibiotics in that, we just place on ice and then we just, we just need to get it in the lab like that. So it's a very simple procedure to get it from animal into the lab. Um, it would just be a case of, I think, having a network of individuals who are ready to go. Um, so we try to have that with Kathy, where it was through the dick vet, Kathy would get notified. She'd, be getting the tissue and then she would notify us and we kind of had, have us on speed dial to come into the lab and try and help with that and that's a system we're happy to work with going forward as well and to be involved in you yes you can yeah so um that's probably a key point as well we can freeze these and never have to, like we don't have to keep going back to an animal every time so once we've got enough material frozen down we can take them to multiple passages we can freeze down hundreds of if not thousands of vials in theory um so we can we can create a real biobank around this as well um for, for, I guess, doing legacy based research. So um, next, I'm uh, very pleased to introduce Dr. Joy Ling. Uh, Joy is a postdoctoral research scientist with an interest in mixed communities of bacteria, also known as microbiomes. Um, she completed her PhD at the University of Reading in 2015, which focused on the microbiome of horses with grass sickness. Um, and this was partly funded by the Grass Sickness Fund. After this, she worked at the University, University of Surrey on a number of horse gut biome, uh, microbiome projects, and she's currently working at the University, University of Liverpool. Let's check it out. Um, hello everybody, thanks to the um, organisers for inviting me to talk to you all. Um, I'm going to be talking about omic sciences. I know that Chris mentioned a couple in the previous, uh, in his talk. I'm going to concentrate on the two that I know the most about. 
um, and these are the two that I used during my PhD um, to better understand what's going on in equine grass sickness. So um, as was said in the introduction, um, I did my PhD at the University of Reading, um, but it was in collaboration with both the University of Surrey and the University of Liverpool. Um, and that was the first project that I did, that how I kind of got into working on horse gut microbiomes, and that's what I've been doing on and off for like the last 10 years. Okay, so when I say omic sciences, most of these omic sciences have a meta at the beginning of the word, so it goes meta something omics. So meta just literally means identifying all of the certain something within a sample. In this case, uh, biofluids taken from horses. And then omics is simply just the study of an ohm. So if you're looking um, at it, if you're looking at the genome, it's genomics. If you're looking at proteins and the proteome, it's proteomics. Um, so the two metaomics that I'm going to be talking about is metabonomics, which is the study of metabolites, which are small um, biochemical molecules, mostly made up of carbons and hydrogens. And I was looking at those in horse urine, uh, blood and feces. And then the second branch of the study was to use metagenomics um, to look at the bacteria within horse fecal samples and we're studying um, the genetic material of those bacteria, hence metagenomics. So before I started this project, there was starting to be work done with it, uh, on what kind of bacteria were prevalent within the horse gastrointestinal system because horses need uh, rely upon their bacteria found mostly within the large intestine and their cecum to be able to ferment and um, release short chain fatty acids from their high fibre diet. Um, but we also use samples of um, horse faeces. It's more readily available, accessible, it's non-invasive. And we can kind of use that as a proxy for what's going on in the large intestine. So what kind of bacteria would we expect normally? Um, this is, there's going to be a couple of um, plots like this. This is basically um, a the total to 100 of the types of bacterial groups that are identified by sequencing. Um, so when we use this approach, we can see that whether we sample the cecum, the large intestine or faecal samples as two uh, major bacterial groups, Firmicutes and Bacteroidetes, um, found across um, the cecum sample there, uh, the beginning of the large colon, the right ventral colon, uh, left ventral colon and then faecal samples. Um, but the percentage, uh, the ratio of Firmicutes to Bacteroidetes um, differs slightly when you move along the large um, intestine. When I first started working on this area, um, this approach was taken to kind of look at what healthy versus um, ill animals looks like. And um, there was a paper that came out in 2012 looking at horses, uh, what the feces looked like of healthy horses compared to horses with colitis. Um, and you can see that the blue and the red bars, which I think blues, firmicutes and reds, um, bacteroidetes, these differed on average when you're looking at healthy horses compared to horses with colitis. And then there's a more recent um, paper that came out looking at horses who had elective surgery versus colic surgery. Um, and you can see again, um, on average, so these are a mean of the horses within the two groups. Um, the percentage of these two main bacterial groups differs between the two groups of horses. So there was kind of an establishment of trying to figure out what happens to these groups of bacteria within the horse's gut or within feces um, when they undergo when they're ill or they undergo surgery. So how do we kind of get this information? Um, as I said before, quite often fecal samples are used just because they're readily available, non-invasive, and they um, contain the vast majority of the bacteria that will be found, especially towards the end of the large intestine. Uh, we do a DNA extraction kit, which gives us the bacterial DNA. And then um, traditionally we amplify um, one gene that is conserved in all bacterial genomes. So we then have lots of copies of this gene. Um, and then we send it off for sequencing. There's many companies and universities um, that do um, genomic sequencing. And then we get back um, sequencing files, which we then analyze with high power computer clusters. Often these programs are really unhelpfully um, command line based. Um, so I've done a lot of that analyzing um, sequencing files using high power computers. So the other half of uh, what I did for my PhD was um, metabonomics and the vehicle for um, 
doing with tabonomics, I used a um, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Um, so I had my sample, I did this on all three biofluids, but I'm just going to stick with urine for now. Um, I added a buffer to this urine, it's really simple, um, prep to be able to analyse the sample using NMR. And then I think this picture cropped up before actually, this is me putting my samples um, on the NMR machine in Reading. So um, all the NMR analysis was done um, in the biochemistry um, lab in Reading, but I ran it all myself. And basically what's happening, it works a little bit like an MRI machine. So you've got really large magnets spinning and they then spin the sample and spin the molecules within the sample. Um, and most of these metabolites have hydrogens. Well, they all have hydrogens, sorry. And it's the hydrogens that get spun. And when they relax back from being spun, they let out a signal. And that then ends up giving you a graph that looks a bit disgusting and like this. But basically every single one of these peaks is a hydrogen within a different biochemical environment. We can then convert this to data. So each along this spectra, as we call it, we take multiple data points that then gives us thousands of um, num numerical data for each sample. Um, and we can have this for you know, hundreds of samples. Um, I then analyse this call with multivariate data analysis, which I know was mentioned before. Um, and basically it's just looking for the biggest difference within the data set within all the samples. So instead of looking at the difference between X and Y, you're looking uh, what's the largest difference within thousands of variables. Um, and then we can uh, um, produce a plot like this. I think this was there was a plot like this in the previous talk, and this is a principal component analysis plot. So it's just um, the x axis is just explaining the largest variance within the data set. And most simply, when the um, samples have similar composition, they'll cluster together. So if you have two groups of samples um, and you're looking for a difference, you want them to cluster away from each other. So this was just some other work that I did where um, you've got control infected mice um, and your um, control samples cluster together. So they're similar in composition, but they cluster away from the infected samples. And then we can look at uh, what metabolites cause this difference. Um, so there's just a single peak pointing down um, and if it's pointing down, it means that it's increased in samples that are at the lower end of the X axis. So that would be these controls um, and that just shows that our control animals have an increase in acetate. So taking these two approaches into consideration, I then took them to the problem of equine grass sickness. Um, and I sampled urine, feces and plasma from 40 ho horses over two years at the Philip Leverhulme Equine Hospital at the University of Liverpool. And we sampled 19 horses with grass sickness, 15 match controls. So these were horses that were grazing in the same field as the horses that became ill with grass sickness. And then we also took samples from six hospital controls. So these were horses that were in the hospital for another usually colic related disease. Um, so the first output that we got from the metagenomic analysis was all about bacterial diversity. Um, so the idea within horses is the more bacteria you have, the more healthy your gut is. Um, so we saw when we um, generated the data um, for each of the three groups, so it's match controls, hospital controls and grass sickness, um, we had a higher total um, number of observed species in the match control horses and the hospital controls when compared to the grass sickness horses, which had um, a lower number of bacterial species. And then if we start to look at what kind of bacterial um, groups are within these samples, so this is a um, plot similar to what I showed before. Um, these are average of the whole group of uh, match controls, hospital controls and grass sickness horses again. Um, you can see that the the two control groups look quite similar, especially in terms of the percentage of Firmicutes and Bacteroidetes bacteria, uh, whereas the horses with grass sickness, there was an increased amount of Bacteroidetes bacteria within the faeces and a reduced amount of uh, Firmicutes bacteria. So I did some work at just looking at what other bacterial groups are um, increased or decreased in the three groups of horses. Um, and I just wanted to bring this up to demonstrate that 
all horses um, fecal microbiomes or gut microbiomes are different to one another um, and that was something we see in healthy horses and something we saw in grass sickness um, so these bacterial groups were all ones found to be increased in the match control horses whereas um, reduced and this one's pretty much non-existent in the grass sickness horses um, each one of these bars is a single horse um, so even though these bacterial groups are coming back as increased in our control horses, um, it's not universal across all of our individuals that we sampled. And we saw the same kind of thing with the bacterial groups that were increased in our grass sickness horses. Uh, your analysis kind of gets a little bit skewed by a couple of individuals where these groups are really high um, and it can be completely non-existent in some of the horse the samples from horses even though they're still in the equine grass sickness group um, but one thing I did notice that these groups that were increased in the grass sickness horses are pretty much non-existent in the control horses so the second half was to look at the metabolite differences um, present in all three biofluids that we analyzed um, so again these are the principal component analysis plots that I showed before. Uh, this is for urine, so we can see that the match control, it's not quite as cleanly separated as the example I showed before, but you can see that on the left, the match control horses are clustering away from the grass sickness horses, suggesting there's differences in their urine composition. And then when we explore what causes this, um, we get the peaks for hip urate pointing down, which means that horses with um, the, in the control group have increased levels of hip urate compared to the grass sickness horses. Um, in plasma, the separation wasn't quite as nice, um, but we can still see that um, the control horses have an increased amount of acetate in their blood and the grass sickness horses have increased levels of glucose and arginine. And then feces, you can see that they've actually split in the plot on the y-axis. So we've got the control horses at the top, the grass sickness horses at the bottom, um, and the peak for acetate is pointing up, which means that the horse, the match control horses have got high levels of acetate in their feces as well as their plasma, and grass sickness horses have got increased levels of glycerol in their feces. So we took the results from the urine forward, because these were kind of the strongest statistically, and did another multivariate analysis, which is what we call a supervised model. So we're telling the program, OK, these ones are from uh, the control group, these ones the, from the ill group tell us what the difference were, differences are, whereas before we didn't tell the computer that. Um, so it doesn't chuck out a, a PCA plot, but we still get a similar colour plot to what we saw before. Um, and this model showed us that there was a number of metabolites um, increasing grass sickness horses. So those are the ones pointing up, um, including O-acetylcarnitine. And then um, in terms of the uh, metabolites increased in match controls, we're getting an increase in hip rate, which is what we saw before, and also an increased level in 4 cresyl sulfate. Um, so what we did with this computer model was we used a predictive function. So we had got an extra five samples of urine from grass sickness horses, an extra four samples from control, um, did NMR analysis and then put it back into the computer program and said, OK, um, using this model, can you tell me which ones are control and which ones got grass sickness from? And this case is the whole metabolic spectra. So one on the y-axis is grass sickness and zero um, is control and it basically gave me a value um, between minus one and one for all of the, the samples that I put in. And you can see there's a there's a, a separation between the predicted disease classes. Um, they've not all kind of come out perfect as zero for control and one for grass sickness, but it just shows uh, promise for using metabolites within the urine of grass sickness horses for um, potential diagnosis. Um, so I think this is my last slide. I just wanted to put together what I kind of saw as the direction of omics approaches for grass sickness, taking into account what I saw during my PhD. Um, so the metabolite biomarkers um, that we saw in the last slide 
uh, could have the potential as non-invasive diagnostic tools um, and maybe using other approaches such as mass spectrometry, we could also analyse um, urine, blood and faeces um, to identify other small molecules that could be used as a non-invasive diagnostic tool for grass sickness. And then finally, um, something that we've been trying to do more, especially um, in Surrey, we were doing more shotgun metronomic sequencing. So instead of having um, a single bacterial gene, making more of that and then sequencing it, we took the whole, um, all of the bacterial DNA that was extracted, sequenced that, and then tried to identify what bacterial, um, bacterial species were in the sample. Um, so this is just a plot from some samples that we uh, sequenced with metronomic sequencing. Um, along with the Quadrum Institute in Norwich. Um, and again, you can see we've got Firmicutes and Bacteroides bacteria, um, but this is a phylogenetic tree and every single one of those dots is a bacterial species. And the ones that are white at the end are ones that are not in current databases. So there's really a lot of bacteria um, within the gut that we don't know what we need to give it a name. We don't know what it does um, and we don't know what its relationship is with um, equine health. Um, and this sequencing will also tell us more about its function so we can get genes and find out what they're actually doing within the, the gut of the horse. So I'd just like to thank um, Chris, who is my PhD supervisor, uh, John, who was at Reading's now at University of Southampton, and then all of the bacterial DNA sequencing was done at the Centre of Genomic Research with Alistair Darby at the University of Liverpool. Um, and thank you for listening. Um, thanks very much. That was uh, also a very interesting talk and I think particularly thinking about what came out of the crucible event that the microbiome was really at front and centre of that to see what's going on uh, in that area. Uh, that was really interesting. Thank you very much. Um, any burning questions or? Ian. Just one. What about spore formers? Do you think your technique extracts DNA from spores for instance. Bacteria that are spore yeah. formers. Um, oh, sorry, I forgot about that. So the original technique should amplify DNA from all different bacteria. Um, it just the thing we're kind of, especially with that technique, is we're reliant on databases and a lot of the databases when you're looking at horse samples, they don't have some of the bacteria. So we're rely if they're in the human database and that's already been characterized, then it should we should be able to identify it. Yeah, I was thinking the DNA extraction from the spore itself. Oh, OK. I don't know. That's not something I know about. We're kind of a, a slave to the DNA extraction kits yeah, and how well they would they would do that. So I, I don't know. <laughs> Thanks. OK, so um, finally, uh, we're going to have a talk from Hayley Coulson, who's um, a uh, a master's student actually yeah, at the University of Edinburgh um, and this project is involved at the Equine Grass Sickness Fund. Um, so Hayley has a PhD in glaciology so we're going off on a tangent here it may seem but bear with, uh, bear with us. She has a first class BSc degree in physical geography and environmental science and uh, currently she's studying a master's by research at Edinburgh, as I mentioned, investigating the meteorological conditions associated with equine grass sickness and the formation of a predictive risk based model. Um, which I think will be it's in, of interest to all of us scientists and otherwise, but uh, I think particularly for the horse owners, as you'll find this pretty interesting. So for our project, Haley is using data provided by the Equine Grass Sickness Fund collected as part of the Mordens Biobank Initiative. Hi, um, I'm a bit out of practice of doing this, so bear with me because <laughs> I might be a bit rusty. Um, and I realise we're out of time, so I'll try and I'll try and be ten minutes. Um, will be my aim. So I'm hoping going one way. Right um, there we go. Um, so I'd like to thank my funders, um, which is the Equine Grass Sickness Fund and the uh, Royal Agricultural Society of Scotland. Um, this started, I'm a horse owner and it started with me getting really irritated on Facebook by looking at the distribution maps um, and then having a little bit of a read and I couldn't
get an answer for the distribution so that just sort of got my brain going and it all sort of snowballed from there so we're sort of a year from me first initially sort of looking into this um, so uh, yeah looking at the meteorological conditions associated with equine grass sickness um, and try and see if we can make a, a model that helps predict risk for the disease um, so the aim is to try and find a unique set of weather conditions linked to EGS cases to be able to predict those high risk times for the pasture kept equines um, and to the objective is to make that model um, for the high risk times match the weather conditions to a UK weather system and to produce weather warnings predicting EGS risk for the UK uh, for the vets and public. Um, so EGS weather, um, there's been papers uh, there have been research on it so the DOCSI um, sort of uh, found cooler drier weather with the regular ground frosts, um, Wiley found that more sun hours and frost days um, and small decrease in risk with less rainfall, uh, sorry, with more rainfall. Um, and then the vets talk about equine grass sickness weather and um, owners have given lots of a variety of different weathers on the questionnaire when I had a look at the questionnaire as well. Um, so one of the things is really just to try and can we pin this down a little bit more and actually get some sort of real numbers to it and a weather system really, because if it's weather, we need a weather system because the UK is um, influenced by our weather, weather systems coming over and we can't really predict anything without knowing that. Um, so we started the pilot model using um, cases and weather stations from the internet um, and used to find the match the case to the closest weather station, pull off the um, data from there um, and then I'll show you the graph on the next slide um, of sort of where, how that developed. Um, we're then looking um, at sort of uh, looking at the historical data now, we need to use the Met Office data and their big gridded model for the UK. And what we did with both of these is look at the minimum temperature uh, for the day, the maximum temperature for the day and the fluctuation between those two. And then afterwards I added in precipitation as well. So how much rainfall that day had. So this was one of the pilot graphs. Um, so the red um, squares are the cases and I'm just going to come down. Um, so what you get is oh, the box area is springtime and the most obvious thing from there is you can see these really big fluctuations in temperature. Um, and what you get with the second box, if you see, um, is you've got an average drop in temperature as well. So the first thing and the main thing I've looked at is those fluctuations in temperature. Uh, basically between day and night and but one of the things that has come up as well is that I need to have a look at seeing what this average temperature drop and does that have any significance as well for cases um, so probably about six six or seven of these up so that's the entire year of all the maximum and minimum temperatures for each day um, so what we got from there is um, I took off what seemed to be the pattern in those fluctuations for the maximum temperature and minimum temperature. Um, and so we came up with the initial model and what we've got here is a case and I've uh, blocked off those fluctuations. So they pop up red on the model if they're sort of the worst. Obviously amber is um, not great either. So just sort of going down. But what the key is you, you really need the whole lot to be red or amber. You can't just have one red, one amber, um, it's got to be the whole lot. So what that came out as was maximum daily temperatures were over 10 degrees. The minimum daily temperatures were below eight degrees. You had a fluctuation of 12 or more degrees between the maximum and minimum temperature that day. Um, and what I did was with that and the dates is then matched it to a UK weather system. So the UK weather system is a high pressure system or an anticyclone and if these stick around they turn into blocking anticyclones and they can persist for um, you can have a week basically all the weather that we all really really love <laughs> is is your high pressure system it's a nice sunny days it's really warm in the day um, what you might not notice is it actually can get really really cold overnight in those systems as well so big drop in temperature and um, you know get freezing and freezing vents with them very little winds calm winds no clouds or little clouds 
and uh, no rain or very, very, very little rain. So these were three of the cases that came in from 2022. Um, again, this is not using the Met Office data. This is just the personal weather stations. Um, and so we plot them up. Apologies that they're absolutely tiny, but trying to get that much data onto the screen is quite hard. <laughs> um, so you can see the cases at the bottom there. So the darker is the um, acute cases, and then I think that one is a dynamic two acute and a subacute. I've boxed off the high pressure system that you can see there. And then if you look at the rest of the data, you can see that there's green ticks in there. So that's sort of where there's um, green ticks we can just sort of um, discard that. Um, so that's three cases that all came in at a similar time. And that's, this is the high pressure system um, that was flagged up by the model. So if you watch the red dot, um, what, one of the things that I would love to do, so this matters is part time for me on top of a full time job. Um, and doing this sort of thing is very time consuming, but I'd love to do some more of it because I think this would be really, really interesting. So you've got the three cases um, coloured in on the UK there on the east side of the UK. And if you watch the red dot come through, it comes over, sits just sits just off Wales for a bit. So there is actually a case that did come through in Somerset as well on this, which matches. Then the red dot sits up in Scotland. There was a case that came through in Perth. Um, and then it sort of hangs around, heads off east again. Um, there was a case that came in this year, um, sorry, last year, I think it was last year um, which completely threw me off because I'm sitting watching the weather and I was just like, can't see where that came from. And what it was, was it was down on the south um, coast, south of England, and the high pressure had actually just snuck into the bottom of England. The um, rest of the country was fine. It was just that south of England case came through there and then it moved itself back off again. So for me, it, I think it's really interesting to see what extent these high pressure systems possibly have on um, sort of the location of these cases and the timing of the cases. And um, we had an, there was another set of cases that came through with the high pressure came in from the west and the case came in in Wales first. Um, and then a case came in further across in England after, which again matched that track from west to east with the timing. Um, so, but this is really time consuming sitting, getting all the, the surface pressure charts off and just sort of plotting it all up. Um, but I think it'd be really useful to do. So, um, the timing of the cases and geographical location. So, the, the big swing in fluctuations of those temperatures are typically seen in the spring, and that's when we have the most equine grass sickness cases come through as well. Um, you also get them in the autumn months, and there's also usually that little peak in the autumn as well. Um, it's also um, typically where the cases are around the world, it's the temperate climate. So the temperate climate has these fluctuations, so it matches with the worldwide distribution as well. Um, and we've, we're looking at a case, um, cases in Italy, which also match in and have the same temperature fluctuations because of where they are in the central spine of Italy. Um, they're more prominent, they seem to be more prominent in this sort of eastern central areas of the UK. Um, and the West could potentially be buffered um, by you've got this tropical maritime air mass that comes in. And while I've been watching Aberystwyth's weather for the last year, <laughs> um, I also rang the vets up there because we, we, um, they were our old vets and I asked them and she said she'd been there 20 years and only had two cases. And they I don't think they've come up once in the entire year when I've been watching the temperature ranges for hitting. Um, hitting those large fluctuations. So sort of the, the Lake District there, sort of down that side, sort of southwest Cornwall, you don't get the fluctuations and it's also wetter as well. Um, and so also I think Ireland would be really interesting because I've heard people say that the that you don't get that many cases in Ireland. So if you do get cases, where are the cases and have you got this west east split again? Um, and is that sort of western side of Ireland buffered from the the moist air basically coming coming up and through. Um, and French Tell also found the link between the timing of the cases and the spatial distribution as well. So that that feeds back. I didn't actually read anything <laughs> before I plotted up my graphs and then I started plotting stuff up and then going through the literature. And it was really interesting to see that actually some of the literature does fit in with with what you're finding. Um, uh, I think uh, I was also looking at 
Orkney was a bit interesting because the cases up there seem to be on the east of the island as well. So whether that's like a tiny little um, small scale version of what's going on with the UK, I'm not sure. But they, yeah, they, they cluster on the east um, rather than on that western side. So, um, yeah, it, I just think it's fascinating. Um, I also plotted up and it's early days, but I had a look at the North Atlantic Oscillation, which is like a, a big system and that decides whether we have colder uh, winters or whether we have warmer, milder winters. So I'm just looking up to see if there's any links going back to like the big circulation as well, because if we can nail that down, so I've only plotted four years up at the moment, um, but it looks promising, but <laughs> only four years. So if we can get a few more years plotted up, um, that would be quite good um, evidence. So sort of big atmospheric circulation, then the UK sort of map, and then you've got local right down to the microclimate level, where you could be looking at places like, um, so Aberdeen, sorry, the Aboyne area, the Dee Valley is really interesting because they get the phone winds. So that area gets crazy fluctuations in temperatures. Um, so all of that size is explained really nicely with them. They get quite a lot of the big swings in temperatures going on there and they get really warm as well, warmer than other places. So um, yeah, it could be really, really interesting. But looking at the, the sort of small scale, um, are some of these locations sitting in frost hollows are they at the base of slopes where you, the cold air runs down the slopes um, and then you've got that sort of uh, you get the minimum temperature being much lower than somewhere else. Um, so this is like a whole PhD in several over. <laughs> um, so trying to I need to I always have to try and like move myself back in. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's really, really fascinating. Um, so does it match every case? No, it doesn't match every case. Um, and the and when people when owners submit their data in, it's so important because some of the cases where they haven't matched the weather, and then I've gone back to look at the notes, um, and you see some of the notes, and you just think, ah, oh, okay, then it, it it that context is so important. Um, so one of them was stable, so the weather didn't match. Of course, had been stable, so I was like, right, okay, <laughs> that one makes sense. Um, some of the cases, some of the chronic ones. The weather is not as clear cut either, so it might be sort of rumbling on a little bit on and off. Um, so that's all things I need to look into and it's going to take some time because there's a lot of data to get through. Um, so yeah, the main aim to determine to what extent um, these systems have on increasing the risk um, and then looking at those temperature ranges that should help with the environmental conditions that contribute to the disease. Um, EGS, a multifactorial disease, it's likely that weather adds to the perfect storm rather than be the, the thing that um, is the key, um, but it could just be like that, that tipping point um, for the disease to develop. The best outcome would be able to be able to predict these high risk times and help disease, reduce disease development. So that's that's the main aim. Um, yep, I think I'll leave it there. So yeah, next next steps is um, getting all the Met Office data off and, and going at it. But there's a couple of issues I've already found with that where it's not so good for frosts and frost hollows and minimum temperatures necessarily. So you lose a bit of that microclimate. Um, so I need to look at how good the personal weather stations are compared to um, the Met Office gridded data because they just extrapolate it out basically. So um, yeah, hopefully we'll get some answers. Yeah, so yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much, Julie. That was really interesting. Um, any questions? Yes. Um, yeah, the, the context is really, really important with them and just sort of those what's gone on um, as the big picture. Definitely. Yeah. Kind of goes back to the biology. Do you think it's that essential fluctuation, <laughs> yeah. wide fluctuation that could be part of the stress? I have, the holes? I'm trying not to go down that rabbit hole because I've sat, I, ha I mean, I have, I mean, are you going to naturally? Um, I'm trying not to because 
I've got too much to do <laughs> and, it's, and trying to if I can get the temperatures done and just get it sort of confirmed and just like yes these temperatures brilliant I can then go with those temperatures because they should constrain whatever's going on basically because yeah, that, that data could be really powerful in future studies where yeah you yeah predict a weather system's going to come in yeah to that level you can sample before and after and look at the, the at what's going it's um and it, then it gets more complicated so if you're talking about the fungi like with bruce maybe it's not looking at just the high pressure systems maybe you then need to go back like what different months are doing so it, it i mean it's a massive project look like massive but i'm just sticking to the high pressure systems for now and then but yeah you could you could open it up to look at all sorts and try and test it because certain fungi might have certain temperature ranges for spore um sorry toxin production or yeah it yeah it's a it's a it's a big question <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, well, I'd just like to thank all the speakers in the second session. I thought it was a really interesting session, actually, showing some new approaches. And uh, I was struck not only by the, the science, but, but the enthusiasm of the speakers as well was quite um, striking. So I think we're in good hands for the future, hopefully. So I think I'd like to hand back to Kate. Are you doing a Yep. <laughs> and Sally. Yeah. Hi again, everyone. So the next award that we're going to give out is the Heidi Award. Um, so the Heidi Award is a beautiful trophy that was donated to the Equine Grass Sickness Fund by the Seath family in memory of their beloved mayor Heidi, who was lost to grass sickness. It's awarded each year to someone who has given outstanding support to the Equine Grass Sickness Fund. And it's not an easy task and never is an easy task to pick out an individual because there's been so many people deserving of this award. So a huge thank you to everyone that has helped and been involved. Um, and we really appreciate what everyone does. This year our award is going to go to somebody who's been raising funds for us for several years for the Equine Grass Sickness Fund. So she delights the world with her beautiful images of Highland ponies taken at the Heel Town Highland Pony Stud high up on the moors in Northern England. She has an inspiring approach to fundraising involving many people in a Facebook competition each year to choose the images for the calendar. She's worked hard to gain the photography skills that are required to be able to produce these photos and is an inspiration in the way that she's combined a personal passion with raising funds for a worthy cause. Melody's a close friend of the Balmoral Highland Pony Stud and was distressed at the loss of the Queen's beloved stallion Balmoral Hercules and Lord. Soon after the stud, Heel Town lost a pony themselves, Heel Town Drumlin. As is the, the story for so many, she wanted to do something to help and started to produce the annual charity calendar. Since then, Melody has been a great support, not only producing her calendars, but sharing the, her PR, PR prowess with us and even doing the honour of presenting the rosettes to our, our survivors parade at the Highland Show. Melody also came to our event last autumn to meet our patron, Her Royal Highness Princess Anne. So Melody, if you would like to come up and collect your award, please. So thank you all very much for a very long morning, but really interesting morning. And um, you'll be pleased to hear it's lunchtime now. Um, we're running slightly late, um, but lunch is being served in the atrium. So please take the chance to have a chat with the speakers. And I'd like to thank all the speakers this morning um, for really brilliant, interesting and thought provoking talks. Congratulations to trophy winners. Um, and thank you to Elspeth for, for chairing the session. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, can I, can I ask if you could be back about just after two o'clock?